Hello everyone. It is time for our live stream. Let's see, I'm jamming things around on the screen here for today. I uh, am on time. Ooh, a thumbs up came up before the first comment. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Where's my thumbs down? Come on. You always come out of nowhere. Hello, Malcolm. You are first. I'm sure we have audio. I didn't even double check. Yes, I see audio. Hello, Brockton. Miguel. Miguel is salty. Hello, Alberto. Andrea. Hi. Thanks for joining. Hello, Derek. Sean Sizzle Reef. That's a good name. I bet all your corals are hot. Hi, Don. Jay Fusion. Akbar. Ken. There's so many of you here. Hey, Andrew. Awesome. <laughs> Harvesting seed corn. Is that anything like candy corn? Hi, Tristan. Thank you very much. Alrighty. So, today's topic. Specific There's my thumbs down. I knew it was coming. <laughs> I feel better. Everything's right in the world now. Uh, today's topic is about placing corals, so we're going to talk about that. But uh, first, I want to talk about the reef behind me here for a moment. I, I, I do pre-record video in advance, but I took some pictures today. So this photograph you're looking on your screen is actually from about an hour ago of the sunset montipora that is growing at the top of my reef. Um, it's recovering from the losses we had about a month ago, where I had that main coral go up in smoke. I did a video called RTN that you can check out if you haven't seen it yet. And this coral was really pretty. And I took all the pictures under the Reef Bright XHOs today, and I thought my Nikon would have no problem with a blue, but oh my god, so much blue. But let me show you a couple more pictures. Uh, this one here is the end of the reef. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this picture now is I want you to see how full the tank is, because I want you to keep that in mind when we're talking about coral placement, so I need you to have some visuals in your brain. You'll see the Gorgonian in the front, and you see that wall of hammer corals, and I, I want to talk about that later. Matter of fact, I want to put myself a note so I don't forget. And uh, then you see some SPS behind it. That is not how I originally planted this reef. When I first planted it, the end of the tank, the, the, the third, this part here that's glowing behind me, was much lower, so you had a nice view going uphill to look at the extent of the reef. And now that end of the tank has risen up. It's too tall. And it actually is a factor, and I really hesitate making a change, even though it's not my preference. And I'll explain to you why in a little bit. Um, and then I have another pretty picture for you. Let's see. So here is the reef just before the live stream. I need to move myself to this top corner over here. Eh, I hate this. I don't like that I'm in the picture. I want to go away. Let's see if I can figure this out. Sorry. Uh, so this is a view of the tank as of today, just at 1 o'clock, so an hour ago. The first metal halide had turned on. The XHOs are on. There's some glow. And uh, what you're looking at now is just where the tank was. And uh, now the light behind me has actually turned on. So there's two lights over the reef, but not in this photograph because I took this an hour ago. All right, let me show you another picture I like. So this one here will be a lot more blue. This one here is of the left end of the tank. Ignore the flowers in the foreground. That is very misleading. I don't want any of you to think, oh my God, look at those beautiful corals. What is that? Those are terrestrial. <laughs> but uh, everything behind it is growing very well. Um, and you'll also notice some of the directionality of the branches, which is very interesting to me. Uh, dead center under the picture of Marilyn Monroe, kind of dead center of the photograph, you'll see a lot of corals are pointed to the left. And that is the Milka coral that the flow has been affecting for some time, which I don't really understand why, because the shadow caster is in the way, as well as the Drew Zacro, but it continues to blow to the left, which is, um, I would have expected this growth to be straight up, but it is not. All right, and then the right end of the tank, is this picture here. Again, this was just taken just before the metal halide came on. So there's the sea bay anemone. You can see some of the skunk clownfish. You can see the hammer coral, the uh, tongue coral on the bottom of the substrate with all the green dots. Uh, some of my little pesky anemones have snuck into this tank and I'm going to have to get my arm wet and rip out about 15 of these little guys and throw them back in the anemone cube or elsewhere. Um, and then this picture here is uh, at a slightly different angle. Uh, it helps you see some of the growth I want to talk about next. So as you're looking here at this picture, let me scoot this over so it's not so confusing. 
huh, this one's like a different size. Um, in the center is the shadow caster, and you can see a lot of white tips, and I want to talk about that as well, because a lot of times people talk about white tips and they get very, very nervous. So, make myself another note. <laughs> see, my photographs are my notes. All right. And then, um, do I have anything else I want to show you this second? Nope. Nope. All right. Yes. All right. So now let me talk about some of the um, corals that are growing right now in the tank. And I want to remove this thing here. Let's see if I can do this. Let's change this to me. You would think I'm on the screen, but I can't see myself. Hang on. Got an idea. I got to remove all these pictures I added. <laughs> wow. All right, that is unintended. All right, hi guys. Um, so what I wanted to show you next was what happens, let's see if I could do this. Maybe I could do something interesting here. Let's try something else. We're, we're kind of doing it on the fly here. So we'll take this and we're gonna put it right there. I think that looks okay. And the bird's nest you're looking at right there is a very common one. There's nothing fancy about it. It's basically a brown coral with white, whitish polyps. And then it has these tips that are super crazy sharp. Not all bird's nest coral is sharp. There are some that are dull or blunted. Um, bird of Paradise is one of them. This one is not. Um, the hot pink, I mean, vivid pink bird's nest is super sharp like this. And sharp tips indicate really good water quality. So whenever I look in the tank and I see very sharp coral tips on the, that bird's nest, I feel good about my water quality. It's a nice visual indicator without actually breaking out a test kit. Um, I, did, I really wanted to test before I started the stream today, but it didn't work out, and I was working on these pictures for you guys instead. So there's only time for one thing at a time. All right, let's see if we can do, I'd love to do the same size. Let's see what happens here. Nope. So this is the chalice that was getting cooked by the RTN event, and in the background is some of that red Monty that's in the middle of the reef, and this chalice is doing really, really well. And there's a second piece that broke off. It kind of fell off, literally fell, and it's down on the substrate, and it looks just as pretty. And that's a straight on angle. So the only way to really appreciate this course is to look down from above. And I didn't get them on the, on the walk forward or the step ladder today. So <clears throat> also this one here is a little secret coral of mine that almost no one ever sees. This is a favia and it's in the back of my reef. <clears throat> and it's really, really pretty. And it has sweepers this long. <laughs> Get my hand where you can say it. Sweeper's about this long. So I had a really nice coral I picked up at Aquashello last year. I put the, uh, well, I put it on the rock work. Dwayne planted this coral. And the next, or two days later, that my brand new coral was dying. I thought, well, that's so weird. I mean, all the corals did well except for this one. And then, you know, a few days later, I looked at that thing late at night when the lights were out. And there was these long sweepers just pounding away. I was like, that explains why my brand new coral died. All right, fair enough. So I told Dwayne, how dare you? You put that exact... And I was giving him a hard time, and he said, oh, I forgot that coral does that. <laughs> Oops. Um, and then this is a nice picture of a hammer coral, a part of my big hammer colony. And uh, let's see, if, can we zoom in? No, we can always shrink down. But right here in the center, if you even see the little cursor, the center of the coral, there are some long tentacles. And uh, those tentacles are basically looking for space. They're not actually in feeding mode. But it is something to be aware of when it comes to hammer corals because they will reach out and touch their neighbor, uh, which can be okay if it's, the neighbor is a, an acceptable one and not okay if it is a bad choice, you know, like something that could be devoured. Then, um, all right, so let's talk about new growth. And the reason I want to see, I haven't gotten to the topic yet. I'm just talking about my reef, but I kind of thought you'd like some updates, especially because the webcam never looks the reef, never makes the reef look pretty. And so I thought, let me do some close-ups today. And so I, brought, I broke out the macro lens to take some of these shots. And again, I shot them under pure blue, blue light. So we have that blue hue going on here. So this right here is the lime in the sky, which is similar in look to the Acropora Yungae, which is a green slimer. But the lime in the sky has a bluish core while the polyps are green. And I've got a second picture to show you, but I wanted to show you the main part that's growing out is kind of a light blue. And you can see the little polyps kind of poking out barely out of a couple of the little uh, pools. And 
this coral is bursting with growth, which is really, really cool. And the second picture, I'm going to show, let me shrink this down again. I, it'd be nice if they all just shrunk down exactly the same every time. That'd be very convenient. But no. So look at this right here. This is really cool. So that is the exact same coral. And the horizontal beam is the uh, the line in the sky. And then that new growth, it just kind of poked out, about, say, about half an inch. And it was just this white tip. It was like, doink. And then about two weeks later, it is now double in height, and it's starting to make out even a few more branches. Even in the background, if you look in that, uh, uh, what should I say, that blurry section, you can see there's an equally long branch with a couple little tips coming off of it. This one here is really interesting to see. I'm enjoying seeing this brand new growth on the lime in the sky. Then this one here, no one ever sees. <laughs> this is kind of in the purple tort family. The blue tort is the one everyone likes. This one's more purplish. It's in the lower left corner of my reef. It's small, it's taking forever to do any kind of growth. And this is actually what we're looking at here is a lot of new growth. And I realize that it's a very hard picture to look at, but that's just what it is. I'll try and get a decent picture of it under 10K lighting later. And now we're gonna to get to the shadow caster section. So first of all, I'm gonna show you this again one more time. Let me shrink this down. Uh, actually, you know what? Let me see if I can eliminate all these photographs. <laughs> You're like, wow, Mark, couldn't you have got this done in advance? All right, so right, yeah, right there, that's the shadow caster. That thing that looks like it's on fire because of the way the lighting works with a webcam. <laughs> um, this right here, I'm trying to find the perfect one for you. Nope, where is it? Oh, I want right end. I'm looking for the name. Right end. This one here. Okay, I'm going to show you this picture one more time. So the shadow caster is to the left of the big anemone, which is to the left of the green hammer. So in case you're wondering what's the, what's what if you're new to the hobby. So now I'm going to, I want you, again, I mentioned the white tips to you before, and now we're going to look at some of these a little closer up. <clears throat> so I'll take that. Um, this is a branch of shadow caster that is showing all kinds of new growth. You, The more you look, the more tips you'll see. I could almost make it a contest and say, how many tips do you count? Because, yeah, there's a bunch of fingers out there, but then there's all these little tiny bursts of almost like fireworks popping off the main branches. And that is looking at the end of the tank, you know, from the end of the tank, the full length, and you can see all these tips are bursting out. And then this one here is some more growth. Again, from the end of the tank, you can see some more tips popping straight up right in the middle of a branch. And if someone's listening to this show, they're like, I'm so bored. This one here is very minimal growth, but it is a lump of coral skeleton with about 50 uh, different little white brand new starting polyps. It's in the very back of the reef. And then here is another one of some nice growth. This one here was taken with a macro lens, so it, it looks very close. It was actually deep into the tank, but I wanted to share it with you. This is all new. This this didn't wasn't here before. It's all brand new stuff that came off the main colony of what survived the RTN event. And here's another explosion of life. So, I mean, what is there? I mean, just in that picture alone, there must be 20 different tips all coming out at once. Like an urchin. <laughs> kind of cool, right? And finally, uh, this is my last picture of the shadow caster. And this is a horizontal branch that goes off to the left and up. And then right in the middle of the branch, look, brand two, one, two, three, four, five, six tips are coming up and out with more and more to go. So that colony will really fill in um, in the coming months. And uh, the reason I want to show all this to you is because people keep saying, well, how's your tank doing? What's the latest? You know, what's happening? And uh, the latest is the tank is doing great. It's on autopilot. And uh, I'm very happy with what's going on. Now, I don't like the way the tank looks behind me, so I'm going to change one of these lights really quick. Actually, use, use my phone instead. What was I thinking? The power of Apex Fusion. Metal halide off. All right, that looks a little better. So the bright light will be in the back behind me. 
and we will leave off the third one too for right now. That should be okay. All right, so let's talk about today's topic because this is an important one that uh, a lot of people can really benefit from. Coral placement is all about putting corals where they belong in your tank. Now, if you've been asking questions here and getting ignored, that's because I answer all the questions after the topic of the day. So you've put up with my 20 minute intro. <laughs> now we're going to go into the topic for, I don't know, 35, 45 minutes. And then I will be addressing your questions in the chat. And you need to, I would recommend you put at me loves reef and then ask your question. So that way I can find it when I scroll through all the comments that are happening nonstop throughout this stream. That's the best I can do. Um, maybe someday we'll come up with a better system or maybe YouTube will. But for now, that's what we do and that's what works. And the question and answer period usually lasts about an hour, hour and a half. So, I mean, there's a lot of t opportunity for me to answer your questions, but I'm usually at least 20 minutes behind when you type it. So you have to hang in there uh, to get to that point. All right. Core placement. When this, this is a situation where you have to ask yourself a lot of questions before you even put them in the tank. So, I mean, first of all, I mean, the, the dominant question someone might ask themselves is, what is the best spot? Uh, and then I have to ask you in return, and that's the thing. Whenever someone asks me a question, I ask like five more questions back at them to make them think their way through it for logistics. So are you thinking about right now, or are you thinking about the future, what it's going to look like? Um, how will it improve the actual escape of your reef over time? You know, is that the ideal spot now, or is it just you like that spot because you can keep an eye on it for right now, but later on you probably want it somewhere else on the reef, and then can you move it? Um, and then you have to ask yourselves, will the coral neighbors tolerate it? You know, what else is in the tank that could possibly touch it or sting it or eat it? <laughs> because that could actually, uh, you know, kill your investment, so to speak, if you bought a nice coral. So when it comes, you know, so here we are, we're ready to put some corals in our tank. The tank has been running for a while. I don't recommend putting corals in a brand new tank. Uh, I would really recommend if you're starting a brand new tank now and you're just getting your, your, your hands wet, not your feet wet, <laughs> then I would suggest you get one coral and try it out and see what it does in your tank before you buy a lot of corals and end up losing a lot of corals because you're still learning. So I would recommend that you take your time, do a test fish, do a test coral, see how they do. Okay, that's going well. Now I can add a couple more. I would not recommend going crazy and buying 50 because you can save on shipping or something like that. Get a, Just be reasonable. And I'm going to go more into why that matters. Now, when we are talking about placing corals today, we want to know, is it going to be new frags? Is it going to be many frags? Is it going to be frags from a, another person's tank? Is it going to be colonies because you're transferring a system from one to the other and these corals are big? Uh, these are all things that change the needs of the coral and what they're going to get. Uh, and then finally, you have to ask yourself, you have to play it out in your mind, what is the bigger picture? So it would be almost great if you have the foresight to be able to draw an outline of your reef with the different corals to kind of figure out what's going to look best to your eye. And then, of course, that's your dream, but what is the reality? What will lighting do for those corals? Will they be able to tolerate your dream? Or are you literally putting them in the worst spot possible and they have the least likelihood of survival? Because flow matters, lighting intensity matters, uh, like I said, the uh, coral neighbors matter. So we want to make sure that we're putting things in the right spot. But before we even get to that point, you've bought a coral, you come home with it, you're excited, of course you want to put it in your tank. The first thing you need to do is you need to dip it. And there are different dips on the market. Uh, I use two or three. I grabbed one that was handy off the shelf. This one's actually called The Dip. And it's very strong stuff. <laughs> this one comes from Fauna Marin. I have a whole bunch in this bottle. I've used many, many products over the years. Um, the dip definitely works. And uh, it will knock off the external uh, bugs and parasites and things that bother you. It's not an algae cleaner. If you need something that's a little more gentle, I always recommend you have a bottle of Revive by Two Little Fishies. That one is literally on the bottle. It says coral cleaner. And it smells like pine salt. So you have that nice uh, woodsy smell. And it's, by the way, it says on the bottle, do not use this to clean floors, which I don't know if that's a joke or if people actually tried it, but it's it's a coral dip. <laughs> that would be an expensive floor cleaner. Uh, you dip your corals, you take it out of the bag, you acclimate you know, your coral. And acclimation doesn't have to be a big, long thing, by the way. Uh, I remember watching Jake Adams talk about how to acclimate a coral, and he just ripped the bag open, took the coral out of the bag, and just slammed it in the tank and said, there you go, acclimated. And that might be a little too aggressive. I wouldn't quite do that. But I would float the bag for about 10, 15 minutes, let the water temperatures equalize, and then you can pretty much move the coral out of the bag into wherever it's going to go. 
the best place would be a nice little quarantine tank. And the reason for that is if you're going to treat for something like red bugs, if uh, you want to just kind of keep an eye on it before it ever goes in your reef to avoid any kind of uh, scares, you know, it would be nice to have a tank running. And, and a coral quarantine is the easiest one of all because you don't have to do anything. You have a power head, you have a heater, uh, a nice light, and uh, you just keep it running. And then as you get new corals, you can just float them right in that tank. You can release them in that tank. And then when you have time, you can take it out of that tank. You can plant it in the reef. So that's nice if you can do it. But if you can't, it's okay. You can plant the corals in your, or you can put the corals in your tank. But we do the dip first. And that's every single coral you get. Any kind of coral gets dipped. Uh, there's, you may lose things you like. Uh, like let's say, for example, you said, oh man, I really love it when I get a coral that has a barnacle in it or I like uh, skypha sponges, or I like the little micro brittle starfish. Uh, even if you like copepods and amphipods, those will all die being dipped. The point of the dip is to get rid of the problem pests, not the beneficial critters. But usually, uh, most of us just dip. You know, uh, especially uh, those that have been in the hobby a very long time. Our reef's full of all kinds of um, microscopic and also visually visible microfauna, things that you could see with the naked eye or with a magnifying glass, or if you want with a camera and, and a macro lens. But those bugs are already in the tank, so we don't really worry about missing out on new bugs coming in on a new frag. But we definitely don't want to bring in sea spiders. We don't want to bring in acridating flatworms. We don't want to bring in a mantis shrimp. Um, uh, we don't want to bring in red planaria uh, or the aeolid flatworms, which are the weird ones that kind of look sort of like a split sesame seed, but bigger. Uh, these are the ones we don't want in the tank. And so when you're dipping your coral, you follow the directions on the bottle very closely. You stick to the timeline they recommend. And the other thing that's so important, let's say you come home with nine frags and you put them in the dip and you reach in after, let's say it's 15 minutes, right? And you reach in and you take the coral out and you're looking at it and you're inspecting it and maybe you're blowing it off or you're scraping something off. While you're doing that with that one frag, the other eight are still baking in that solution and you put it into, I don't know, a small bowl of water, or you've put it into your tank, and then you go to coral frag number two. And now we're about 18 minutes in, and you take that coral out, and you're inspecting it, you're looking at it, and the rest of them are still cooking in that solution. And you'll end up killing the new frags because they're sitting there way too long. So if you're gonna dip them all, dip them, use a power head or use a small turkey, turkey baster to blow them off, and get them out of that solution into a bowl of tank water immediately. Uh, the best thing you could use is either a white bottom, you know, a white bucket or a bowl that has a white bottom so you can actually see what's coming off these corals. And you, when you turkey baste it, you're going to turn the coral around and around and around and you're going to make sure it's nice and clean. It's rinsed of all that chemical that was in the dip. And now your corals will be okay temporarily in that bowl of water. And now they have to go somewhere, the quarantine tank or your reef tank. If you're going to put it in your aquarium, which I've done, because I used to do quarantine tank and I haven't had one in forever. So they go in my tank, in my reef. The, the place I always put them is right on the sand bed for the first two weeks. Uh, any new coral that comes in hits the sand bed and stays there. A lot of them have a frag plug and I can just press it down into the sand and uh, if I need to I'll stand it back up. But uh, I don't have any kind of fish that bury corals so that's not a fear for me. If you have a bare bottom tank, well it's just going to roll around unless you have some kind of a little frag rack sitting down there to put them in the different holes so they stay relatively stable. Your brand new corals that you've uh, just acquired may change over the next few weeks. They may even become hideous. <laughs> you might have bought something that cost you a lot of money that had a lot of beautiful color and you put it in your tank and it just seems to go right into the browns. And you're like, what happened? Why is this happening? Oh my God. Uh, a coral can lose its color, cor uh, color, cor <laughs> I'm trying to think of the word, coloration because of the transport. It could be because of the dip solution. Uh, it could be your tank, your water is not ideal for, from what it came from. Uh, it could be a few different things. It could even be the lighting or the lack of lighting that affects it and makes it change color. But just because it lost some of its vivid color doesn't mean it's going to lose it forever. Because maybe within 8 to 12 weeks, it's going to be right back to its vivid, nice uh, look again. So don't let that uh, freak you out too much. Just realize that corals do go through moods and uh, they may decline some. But as long as it's got polyps out and the skin looks healthy... It's just not quite as vivid. That's okay. Give it some time. It may turn out to be better. Also, I, I cannot leave this out. Whenever you're buying corals online, you're going to always see the best of the best. And you are going to see a coral that looks fantastic, which is what makes you buy it. I mean, we do that with a brand new car, too. We look at the ad like, oh, my God, I want that car. And, uh, you know, so you're looking at this amazing picture that probably was enhanced just a little bit 
to be the best of the best, so you'll want it. But if you're really trying to do a, a an apples to apples comparison between what is in your hand now and what you saw on the website, the first thing you have to do is look down from above because that's the picture they took. They aren't taking a picture from the side. They are looking straight down through this much water. They got the perfect lighting. And then of course they adjust the, uh, the spectrums by pulling out the blue or whatever to make the coral look great. So you have to be fair. Your coral has to be in the same conditions. A little bit of water, looking straight down from above. Hopefully your spectrum of your lighting is around the same theirs was to then say, yeah, that's pretty much what I ordered. Okay, we're all good. You wanna make sure that you're happy with your purchase. But there are times people say, this looks nothing like what I bought on the website, and that is an entirely different show. <laughs> so I'm not going to get into that. But if you, I just want to throw it out there. You know, be fair. You know, try and mimic as much as what you saw to see if you can even find hints of what that coral was supposed to be. So I told you I put mine down on the sand for a couple of weeks, and then after that, now it's time to put them somewhere. But why do I put them on the sand? A lot of people want to know the reason for something. Well, think about this. It just came home from the, okay, let's say you bought at the fish store. You went to the fish store, you saw it, you loved it, they bag it up, you throw it in your car, you drive, you pick up three more things on the way home, the bag got hot, the bag got cold, I don't know. Uh, things have changed, it's rolling around in the bag possibly, it's, it, who knows, it could have got smashed a little bit, you know, against another bag. Things happen before it finally gets to your house. And then you take it out of the bag and you dip it in something chemically, and then you remove it from that, and now you jam it into a reef tank that probably has a different alkalinity level. Uh, lighting doesn't really matter for that first minute, so I'm not going to say lighting's affecting it, but it's just generally pissed. And the reason I put it on the sand bed is get my hands off the darn thing and let it be for a couple of weeks to recover from what it just went through. Now, if you didn't pick it up locally and you bought it online, it's even worse. <laughs> it's everything I said plus shipping, and <coughs> it could be in the back of a hot truck, it could be in the back of a cold truck, uh, it could have been delivered longer than you anticipated, like you expected to have it in 12 hours and it took 18 hours, it could have been lost in shipping for an entire day. Uh, these things happen. I mean, that's part of the challenge of buying things online. It may not always work out. And in that case, the bag could have leaked. Things happen. And so your coral has been through a lot. So the idea is to get it dipped and then get it into some decent water as quickly as possible and get your hands off of it. Don't put glue on it, don't put putty on it, don't handle it, don't move it, don't turn it around. <laughs> Set it in the sand and walk away. And just, you know, kind of check on it. And, you know, and if a couple of days it's it's leaning over, you can do something to, like, prop it up without your hand. You know, some kind of a Kent scraper, uh, an acrylic rod, whatever. Again, don't let your oil of your skin get on that coral. You don't want to be grabbing the coral and squishing the polyps as you're trying to ride it. You know, if you're trying to grab a frag plug you're holding it in your hand, maybe you grab it from the edges so you're not touching the coral itself and press down in the sand. Put your finger in the sand, put a finger hole and stick it in there, maybe adjust the sand a little bit. Uh, if you're lucky you have one of these things, you can set it on the sand and put your frag plug right in it and boom. By the way, this works great for bare bottom tank owners, so you've got that. I know it's really white, but uh, hopefully you can see that okay. So it was just something I got somewhere someday, I don't remember. Um, some people want to cut the frag plug off immediately. Again, because you're leaving alone for a couple of weeks, I wouldn't do that yet. It just went through hell. <laughs> so we want to leave it alone. And then a couple of weeks, if you're like, okay, I want to put that coral exactly here. I don't want that frag plug. I'm going to snip it off. You can then. Others might say, well, I don't want that frag plug in my tank because I saw algae on it and I want to kill the algae. I don't want the algae in my reef. Uh, I'm really nervous. I want to snip it off immediately. Then I would say put it in the quarantine tank. So after a couple of weeks, you can remove from quarantine, snip off the frag plug. If algae grows in the quarantine tank, no big deal. But we don't want the algae in your tank. Um, you could also, if let's say this was the frag plug and the coral was sticking on there and you saw bubble algae or you saw hair algae or you saw anything like that, you're going to have to wear gloves and you could hold the plug by the base because usually there's not algae down the part. It's usually on the disc. You can hold it like this. And you can put, you know, take a pipette with peroxide and you can drip, drip, drip onto the algae itself and turn and drip, drip and basically get all the algae wet with peroxide for a couple of minutes. And then you can dip it in a bowl of tank water and the algae that you saw, I mean, it's, it's dying now. And then the next couple of days, it'll flake off and come off completely. I also uh, heard a presentation was given. I never saw it, but they talked about using a water pick with peroxide to water pick your corals clean. But again, try not to hit the coral itself. I wouldn't want to hold the frag to clean the plug. 
But like if you're wearing the gloves at least, you could gently hold the frag and lower the plug into a solution of peroxide just to the surface of the disc so that way the frag doesn't get in the peroxide. I don't recommend putting corals into peroxide specifically. Some can tolerate, some do not. Uh, zoanthids probably wouldn't care. Akins, 50-50. Anything else, you know, like SPS, probably, it, you'll end up losing your corals. Um, here's another thing I have just for no reason. It's a rock with a bunch of holes to hold multiple frags inside the bottom of your tank. Now, it's time to place the coral in your tank where you want it, and you're, we haven't even talked about where, but we're just going to talk about how, and then we'll talk about where next, I promise. <laughs> so now, you have different choices of putting corals, I'm going to get all this in front of me so I can reach it easier, because I have so many items here. I'm even going to talk about something I would never use in the tank. <laughs> okay. So... No, the most common thing we use in placing corals in tanks is going to be cyanoacrylate. And there's every kind of version of it. You know, everyone's got their name brand on it. You'd be, I'm surprised there's not a Milo's Reef version, but that's okay. Everyone else sells it, so I don't need to. So here is Coral Affix, which is a glue. It's from Two Little Fishies. And this is a 0.7 ounce or 20 gram tube. And you have the unscrewable top with a tip, and you can just squeeze out what you need and then close it up again. Sometimes the problem with these tubes is you use it for a while and then this part gets clogged and you still have glue left and you can't get it out. What I recommend you do at that point is take a thumbtack and poke a small hole in the body and then press in to ooze out the glue and apply that to your frag plug or the base of the coral itself and then put it onto your, uh, put it somewhere in your tank. Icy gel is another type of glue that's very popular. It says right on there, cyanoacrylate, which basically means super glue gel. Um, this is a putty from Tunzi. I bought this a long time ago. It was a two-part putty, like most are. This is, by the way, it's no good. <laughs> I've had it much too long for it to be any good. But one end... Wow! <laughs> oh, wait, maybe that's normal. No, I think I broke the lid. I think I've just had it way too long. So one side is a whitish putty. The other side is kind of a peach color. And when you combine the two, it will look um, kind of relatively pink, um, a little bit toward coralline. But the thing is, it's super fast acting. When I bought this, I tried it out, and if I didn't use that little bit I used in 45 seconds, it was almost too hard to use. Now, I don't know if things have changed. I don't know if that was a personal experience of mine, but it's one of the reasons I didn't use very much of it, because I couldn't work fast enough to uh, do what I was trying to accomplish. Uh, this is a very popular brand called Aquamend. This is available everywhere. I believe this one probably is from Two Little Fishies as well. Maybe? No, it's from Polymer Systems. Polymeric Systems. Anyway, Aquamend, I believe, is even something you could find it somewhere like Home Depot. But a lot of times you're going to buy these things from Marine Depot, BRS, uh, Premium Aquatics, or sometimes I have it on my website. This I don't. Here's another type of glue. came out from Seachem, Reef Glue. <clears throat> And then this one here is my favorite. It is the glue grenade from Polyp Labs. So inside there you have this, you go like a grenade, and then you've got these individual tubes in there. And uh, the nice thing about these is you use the tube, you glue two or three frags, you throw away the tube, and you have a nice brand new one for the next time. So having you know, a jar of whatever's in here, 25 of these things, 50 of these things, was what I liked. And so, yeah, of course I got it. And uh, I got a couple of these grenades, but I so rarely buy corals. I, I buy the glue, but I don't have a job. <clears throat> for to use it for um, and then this is a putty that I was telling you I don't use in the reef tank this was sent to me years ago he sent me quite a few tubes he wanted me to do a review and so I did and you mix up the two parts and it's white and you put it in your reef and you can secure things in place but the tank water got really cloudy and that bothered me so I didn't like it to use it in the tank however on the back of this package I was reading how you could use it for plumbing and I had this one leaky bulkhead that I could not solve, and it was in the worst possible place. It was under my frag tank. I literally could not get to the spot without completely rebuilding everything. And I thought, I'm going to try out this EPO putty. And I mixed it up, and I cleaned the drain pipe as best I could under the bulkhead. I, I turned off the water flow so there was no water in the pipe. And I applied the EPO putty. I squished it on there. And then you get your hands wet, and you smooth it so it's nice like Play-Doh. 
And after, I don't know what it was, a couple of hours, I turned on the water and there was no drip. I never had a drip again. So I highly recommend Epo Putty if you're trying to fix a leaky spot um, that you don't want to rebuild. In this case, it's a great tool for repair. And I mean, I don't know what this thing, if this costs $10 and you can repair plumbing where it is without touching it and it just holds water for the rest of your life, that's fantastic, right? So I did recommend it for that. I didn't recommend it for in the tank, even though that's really what they wanted us to sell it for. But I said every hobby should have this for fixing their plumbing. And uh, so I was very happy with that. So there's a plug for a company that I haven't talked to in 10 years. And then finally, my all-time favorite putty is this one here from DD Aquascape. It's their aquascaping putty. This one here has a purple box right here, which means it is coralline color, purplish. They have one that's gray like cement, and I don't want that in my tank. So I always make sure it's purple. If you see gray and you like gray, buy gray but I'm always on the hunt for coralline color because when I put this in there, if my rockwork has any kind of coralline and I put that putty, it looks like coralline to me. It's just less of an eyesore and it makes everything look cohesive. And I'm not looking at brand new globs of putty that I have to wait three to six months to blend in. So I really love this stuff. Um, this one says it was $11. That's probably about right. They might even be a little bit higher. Um, and this is actually something I would love to sell in my shop one day because I highly recommend it. I buy this. 10 boxes at a time. And I use it to hold rock together. I use it to mount frags into place. And uh, it works really, really well. And you have some time. You have two or three minutes after you've mixed it up. Uh, one more final warning about working with putties of any kind. It's highly recommended you wear rubber gloves like the uh, doctor gloves uh, or tattoo artist gloves to avoid getting the toxins of the putty in your flesh because it'll go right through your hand as you're kneading the putty to make it all uniform in color. It goes through your skin and you could end up getting the chills. You could end up tasting metal in your mouth. Not good. And one of the people I learned this from was a guy who had been doing professional fragging demonstrations for years up in Boston. And he was just doing another demo. And next thing he was in the ER and they were trying to figure out what had happened. And he said it was from working with the putty. So he never would work with putty again without gloves. So I've never had to go to the hospital. I learned from someone else's mistake, and I said, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And so I always wear gloves when I'm working with putty. Plus, you can peel it off, and your hands are still clean, which is nice. But uh, this stuff's great, and uh, a lot of vendors will sell this. I usually would buy it at trade shows because there's a booth, like in Dirk's booth, and he would have a box, and I'd grab you know five boxes to go or something. So I really recommend that. All right, so now you know. Oh, and then one more trick, and then I'm going to get to the placement part. Uh, if you're trying to get a coral to stay in place that's being tricky or stubborn, one of the methods that has also worked, you can take your putty, you can make a ball, and then you can you know, use some kind of a thing to make a depression in it. So you're putting a dimple into the ball of putty, and then you can put the, uh, the super glue gel inside the hole, and then you can put the frag inside the glue and kind of press the putty around it, and you've made, you've made some kind of a sandwich. You can even, if you need put some of the glue on the bottom of the ball of putty as you press it into the rock. And so you've glued the putty, the putty is hugging the coral and the glue is holding the coral in the putty. And it's this weird Oreo cookie type effect and it totally works. So if you have a situation where it just absolutely won't stay and you keep trying more putty, it might be time to add a little bit of glue to the putty, not mix it together, but you know, you're know you doing like layers like a wedding cake. And it, it's great. I've had to do that from time to time and it's super handy. Now. Let's talk about actually placing the corals. And this is going to be another one of those things. I've talked about it before, and people always tease me about it. I, I didn't invent the name, but it's called coral pegging. And what we've got here, I'm going to put it in front of my face so you can see this. This is a piece of airline tubing. You can see how old it is because it's yellow. <laughs> uh, this is rigid airline tubing, uh, 3 16 It's the kind of thing you would get at Petco or PetSmart or maybe your LFS. And you cut it to about two inches long, maybe a little bit less. And then I would put my putty, my DD Aquascape putty, on the end of it, and I'd press it on, and this is ready for a frag. Then I can put my frag on top, put a dab of glue, and I can put this in any crevice of the rock work. And if you had the foresight, or if you're about to set up your tank and you'd like, take all your upper rocks, you know, put them where they are. Now you know how they're gonna work. Lift it out of the tank, or lower the water level in the tank, and grab a cordless drill and a masonry bit that drills quarter inch holes, and drill some holes in the very top of the rock work. And then you can put your pegs in any hole that you prefer. And if you put a coral in this one spot and you like where it is, but decide later you don't want it there, you can remove it from this hole and you can put it in this hole. Super convenient. 
And you can have a coral that starts off really small that ends up becoming a giant branch with a peg on the end. And I know that for a fact because when I was helping Ryan with this, no, I think he had a 400 gallon tank back then. He had this ginormous branch and he took it, you know, he grabbed it and he was lifting out the tank and on the end I saw the peg. I was like, are you kidding me? That's amazing. And then, you know, I don't know, I don't remember what he was doing, but I do remember that he was still in the tank. And I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying to put it back. <laughs> so he has this giant coral in his hands. I mean, I think it's, this is not a thin little pencil. This is a colony with huge branch and, you know, thick around. And he's trying to get the peg to find the hole in the rock work. Where was that little tiny hole? Like he's going to make it magically go in that spot again. And I just kind of laughed. So good luck with that. But pegging is super convenient. And I would, I do recommend this to anyone that's Especially after you've done your first tank. On your second tank, you're like, I'm going to peg. It's just so much better. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, we've got different corals we're going to work with. So let's talk about the different ones that exist. LPS. Oh, I'm, so let's start with the simplest. The simplest coral anyone brand new in the hobby is going to get is a softy. And softy corals can go anywhere. And they will eventually go everywhere. So that's one of the reasons why you don't hear experienced hobbyists talking about Green star polyps. You don't hear them talking about mushrooms. Um, you don't hear them talking about Kenya trees. These are all corals. They're fast growing. They have movement. They're pretty, but they're invasive. They really take over the tank. Now, if you don't care and you, you really want those and they are affordable and they're available and you want to do that, you can. I would recommend you try to isolate them in certain spots. Like for example, put the green star polyps on a small rock in the front of the tank, and anytime any of it tries to grow across the sand bed, rip it off, take it to the fish store, give it to another hobbyist, throw it away. You know, <laughs> your choice. But don't let it get onto the rest of your reef, because once it gets onto everything else, you're kind of stuck with that situation. Um, some people want to grow it up the back wall. They want to grow it over the overflow box. They want to grow it on the back of their cleaning magnet. You can. But once it grows onto everything you own and you realize you have nowhere to put any corals, you get really frustrated. So I'm just telling you, certain invasive corals, most hobbyists that have been in the hobby for a while choose not to ever put that in their next tank ever again. They're like, never going to happen again. But that being said, softies can be put anywhere in your tank. They can be up high, they can be down low, they can be in low light, they can be in high light. Softy corals do really well. And when it comes to softies, we're talking about zoanthids, we're talking about recordias and mushrooms, we're talking about the Kenya tree, the finger leathers, um, a toadstool leather is also a softy. Um... Gorgonians are sort of softy-ish. I don't know. Yeah, probably in the softy family. I don't know. They have a, a rigid spine, but... Then the next popular coral from softy people graduate to is to go into the, um, the LPS coral, which is the large polyp stony coral. And LPS corals can be fungias, which some people call wagon wheels. They are, they're a skeleton base and they have striations and it sits on like a circle on your sand bed and there's a mouth right in the center. Fungias are very pretty, easy to take care of, almost are always on the substrate or on the bare bottom of the tank. Um, I, I always recommend sand on the tank, but I know some people don't want that for a couple of reasons. So they go bare bottom, but you, the fungias go there. And if you put it up on a, on a rock work, and especially if you try something nutty like trying to glue it to the rock work, it won't stay there. It's going to pop off. It will find a way. It will super inflate and it will poof and it'll go where it wants to be and it'll be in a new spot. So I don't force that. <clears throat> but other very popular LPS corals would be the hammer coral, the frog spawn coral. Torches are very popular right now, especially if they can get something from Australia or Indonesia. They, they go for a high dollar. People are paying a lot of money. And usually the high dollar expensive ones are the ones that die first. So just keep that in mind when you're buying it. It's sort of like going to Vegas and knowing you're going to come home with less money. All right? Just, just giving you a fair warning. The other LPS corals that you might get are Lobophilia, which are beautiful. I have some right down here. And there are some more in that shadowy spot. And there are some more behind that. <laughs> uh, I've had Lobos for many, many years. There's no work involved. And I usually keep them down low in the tank. But I have had them as much as the midpoint. But like I said, super slow growing. It takes forever for them to split and make more of themselves. If you end up with a bouquet of lobophilia, congratulations. It's not very common. Uh, the hammer coral will grow much faster. 
the hammer coral itself is a hard calcified tube or uh, structure with a soft meaty polyp on the end that has a mouth and can inflate and can retract and uh, occasionally you will suddenly see in the middle of your hammer coral a bubble and what's happened is the single polyp will now have the bubble that then will pop and suddenly you'll have two polyps in that spot and eventually the branches will grow out and you have two branches side by side. And a branch of a hammer, if you look very closely under the living part, you'll see little tiny tubes coming off and those little tiny tubes have little heads. Those are baby hammers too. So anytime you see any kind of life, rejoice because there's more to come. And if you do everything right, those little ones will become bigger ones and you have more of it. Very popular coral. Um, my reef has a whole bunch of hammer coral right there where I'm pointing. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Before. Uh, I mentioned, remember this picture I showed you? Um, I'll show it to you one more time because I want to emphasize something here. So <clears throat> in this picture here, the green hammer is acting like a barrier in my tank now between the sea bay anemone and the gorgonian. And that is, I mean, this tank is three feet wide, and you can see how much hammer there is. That's probably at least 24 inches of hammer, maybe even 28 inches of hammer going front to back. But it's also very, very tall. That's not how I planted it. Underneath, I, I don't know if you guys can ever see my cursor when I do this, but um, on the lower right corner is a frog spawn colony. That's where my hammer was originally. But the hammer has grown taller and taller. The living polyps are always at the top. The part underneath is all dead skeleton. It's what forms the physical reef itself. And in this scenario, this hammer is actually obscuring my view of the rest of the reef, which is a shame. I want to be able to see it, but I can't. <laughs> so I, uh, I want to emphasize that because you want to think about where things are going to go in right now how it looks and what it's going to look like a year from now, five years from now, seven years from now because your reef tank will continue to grow upwards. And the higher it, grow, it grows, uh, the more of your view you'll lose. So if you have this really cool aquascape and you've got this idea about having a valley between the rocks where the fish can swim through and you've got this cave, eventually you're gonna have giant colonies and you won't see the valley, you won't see the cave, <laughs> you won't even see the rock. And that's okay, it's just, it's a change and it's something that you need to be aware of well in advance. Now the solution to my hammer problem right behind me here would be to remove it, cut off about six or eight inches of skeleton and lower the whole thing down. However, the reason I don't want to touch the hammer coral is it is a barrier, like I said, between the sea bay and enemy and everything else. And so I'm thinking, I'm actually better with the wall of hammer there to, because if I lower the hammer down, the sea bay will kill all the hammer. The hammer right now is so tall and the life is all at the top that the sea bay just touches the skeleton the stony part and it doesn't affect it. And so I don't really want to lose all the rest of my my hammer colony. I want it to be healthy and I want it to be pretty. And I'll tell you this, there was one guy, I can't remember who it was, it was many years ago, but he literally had, uh, he had SPS corals up high and he had all these softies down low. I think he had mushrooms or something. And he put a whole wall of hammer coral across the bottom of his tank. And I was like, why'd you do that? He said, I don't want any of these corals to get up on there. And so he created a natural fire break using hammer coral as his defense. And I thought, oh, that's pretty neat. I've never seen anyone do that before. So it might be something you want to try out at some point. Um, that's pretty much it for that part. So now let's talk about SPS corals. The SPS corals are usually considered the pinnacle coral for our hobby. They're the small, small polyp stony. And in the video behind me, where am I pointing? Right here. This is all SPS corals all up along the top. Lots and lots of, actually down low as well. Uh, let me throw up a new picture here. Left end. So in this picture here, you can see Spock in the upper left, the Nassau Tang. There's a cleaner wrasse right next to her. People keep asking me how the wrasse is doing in the background is a purple Tang. But all those sticks pointing up are SPS corals. Uh, the uh, Milka coral is the ones leaning to the left that are kind of under the Marilyn Monroe picture. There is that weird cactus-shaped-looking look shaped looking thing on the right. That is a cactus pavona. That's an SPS coral. Underneath all that, in the green, is the lime in the sky, which is an acropora. Underneath that is a green montipora. There's also an LPS that is called the uh, yellow scroll in the turbinaria family. Um, and then way down at the substrate, you've got chalice corals, and you've got an acan that's in the LPS family as well. 
So you can see I do have, and then in the far left corner, there's a uh, green spongiotis, which is in the Montipora family. It's way down low on the sand, and yet it's an SPS coral. So you can get away with some SPS being down low. But usually they want to be up higher because that's where the most flow is in the tank, where the most water movement can happen, and where the polyps can get a lot, an opportunity to capture food on a regular basis. So if you have SPS corals and you're trying to figure out where to put them, they're eventually going to go up high in your tank. But uh, initially, they're on the sand bed for a couple of weeks before they get moved up. One nice thing about SPS corals that no one ever talks about is anytime you look at the tank, they look great. Uh, unlike LPS corals and softies, those things shrivel up when the lights are out or first thing in the morning they don't look that great. But later on in the day, the reef really looks pretty because they're all opened up and, and they're absorbing the light and they're really happy. But first thing in the morning, they don't look good. <laughs> Same with anemones. These are all things that are, you know, they might be balled up, they might be contracted, but later on in the day, they're really fluffed up and they're gorgeous. But SPS corals, you can look at pretty much any time of day or night. You can hit them with a blue flashlight, you can flip on the blue lights temporarily, and you can showcase how pretty they are because they always look great. And that's a really nice side effect of owning SPS corals. So I'm pushing you toward that one. And then finally, there's another coral that very, very few people talk about, very few people purchase. They're the non-photosynthetic corals. Uh, corals like the sun coral, some gorgonians, um, there's some, I think they're called rizos or rhizos, and these are all corals that need no light at all and need a lot of food and don't do well in a regular reef tank. They usually need a very heavily fed aquarium for them to, to thrive in and to grow and become larger. And if you uh, try to put these corals in your tank, the odds are so strongly against you having a successful story that I just would urge you don't do it. I'd, if you really want that coral, set up a tank for that coral and go nuts. Fill that thing up with all kinds of non-photosynthetic corals, feed the heck out of that tank. The nice thing about non-photosynthetic corals or NPS corals is they don't need light, so you save money on the light fixture. Um, they need a lot of food, which is gonna cost you a bunch of money. And you're gonna have, and you're gonna have kind of murky water, unfortunately. I would love to see crystal clear water, and I'm sure you could do that with a water change. But uh, for the most part, You've got so much phytoplankton in the water, you've got um, rotifest in there, you've got uh, rotifers, um, oyster feast. I mean, there's so many different things. All of these are coming to my head are from reef nutrition, but those, those foods are exactly perfect for non-photosynthetic corals. Now, those corals can go low in a reef tank. They can go under the rock work, um, but they really need to be in their own NPS tank. That's just the best advice I can give you. And you can have a beautiful system. You'll also see strawberry anemones. Like when you go to public aquariums, they're very popular. And they'll have these little tiny fish that come from Catalina Island that go in there, the Catalina gobies. Beautiful little setup, but it's 100% not the reef tank I'm used to running. And I believe the non-photosynthetic tanks tend to run a little cooler too. So you're not having to warm them up, um, you, but you may end up finding you're in a situation where it needs to have a chiller. So do some research and figure out, but. That, I wouldn't recommend that in your tank. I would, I would really resist the urge. Now, I did mention a couple of corals in the beginning, and I don't want you to think you, they can't be in. The sun coral or tubastria is very popular, works in all reef tanks. It just has to be fed. And the sun coral is so pretty. I have a whole web page about this on my website with tons of information and tons of pictures. It's uh, one of my favorite corals, and yet I haven't had it in a long time because it's so much work to feed it. And so you've got all these flowery things that pop open all night long. It's a perfect time to feed them, but you have to stop the flow in the tank and you squirt mice's food all over them and each head closes and they all grab a meal. And five minutes later you come back, they're all wide open ready and you hit them again with some more food. And five minutes later you hit them again with some more food. No, you're done. And if you can do that every single day, like every single night, that would be great. Uh, you'll also find that your hermit crabs and your cleanup crew and your fish even will learn this routine and they will come over and try to steal. And in those pictures I was talking about, because there's probably, I don't know, 40, 50 pictures on that article. It shows pretty much everything in my tank, including serpent starfish, coming over to steal the food from the sun corals because it's like a buffet just waiting for them. They're like, oh, this is fantastic. He puts it right here. We love this. So, uh, but really nice coral, bright orange. There's also a black one that's more in the hunter green. So pretty, and they can be branching, and they can be like a ball. Very, very nice. And then there's the dendrophilia which looks like a really, they actually call them fathead sun corals because the head is two or three times the size of a sun coral polyp. 
those actually use some light. So you can actually have them in your reef tank and they'll absorb light from the, uh, the above as well as dropping in food in the tank and they can eat. And in my tank, way off hidden in that cave, there is two polyps and it's been a year and a half and I still have two polyps. It hasn't done any kind of growth because it's just not getting nearly enough food. If I were to put it somewhere else where I could really hit it with food, I could make this nice little colony and I'd be even happier than I am right now. So I would, you know, do your research on any core you want to buy. And then keep in mind that anything you put in your tank may need to be moved later for a variety of reasons. It could be these two corals that you thought were perfect for each other are incompatible. It could be you have an anemone that's reaching over with the tentacles and just smacking the heck out of it. Um, it could be that one is a fast grower and one's a slow grower and the fast grower will overcome the slow grower and kill it. So you have to really think what is ideal for this area now as well as what will happen in six months or what will happen in a year. The fast growing stuff, you want to keep it away from the slow growers. You know, so if you have this really pretty high end Acropora that was, you know, it's like this big and you plant it on a rock and you know it's going to take forever to grow, but it costs you a fortune. Don't put it anywhere near something fast growing. Don't put it near Recordia's and just go over there and lick it because you'll end up with just a white stick and you'll think, oh, that cost me $500 and it's gone. So we want to make sure to be careful about that. Now, I believe I covered everything on my list. Um, oh, one last thing. Let's go back to, I want to show you another picture. <laughs> one more time. This is something I didn't want to omit. We're just going to go. I really wish I had a decent light picture, but I don't. All I have is these blue pictures for you, but oh well. This picture right here, uh, I showed it to you guys before. I said there's probably about 20 tips there, and they're all basically white. They look light blue because it's under blue light, but they're white. And people think, oh my god, my coral is dying. Look, all the tips are white. This is normal coral growth. The, the tip of the coral is pushing, the skeleton is pushing through the tissue or the skin of the coral. So the skin is very, very thin, and you're basically seeing the skeleton underneath. And then as this coral grows, and as the tips um, have more time in the light, they will, uh, what am I trying to say here? They will pick up the zoanthelli and they will become rich like the rest of the colony. But a lot of new growth on SPS corals will be white initially. That's not death, that's not STN, that's not RTN, that's nothing. It's normal growth. And you're gonna have to learn what's what. You're gonna have to actually physically get corals, get used to them, and study them closely, visually, to avoid overreacting. Because, I mean, I had someone recently send me pictures like, oh my God, I think my corals are all in trouble. And, I, and every picture he sent me, I said, that looks very normal to me. He says, but look! And I was like, still looks very normal. I don't know what you're seeing. Your pictures look okay. You know, maybe you're seeing something in person that I can't in the photograph. But white tips are normal. Then as the lighting hits it, as food hits it, and more polyps form, the zoanthelli grows within it, which is a symbiotic algae inside the tissue of the coral. It begins to match the rest of the colony. Um, that other picture I showed you before, the limer, um, this one here. See, the colony is green. But the stick, I'm going to put it right over my face, the stick itself is that light blue that's between the polyps that you can't even make out in the branch because the branch is so thick and green. But if you were to stare down into the tank, into this branch, this green branch, and look down, you'd see the core is a light blue. Well, this is all light blue. That's normal. And then all these little uh, polyps that are coming out of the skeleton are all going to have the color, and they will eventually all be green with a light blue core. So... This is completely normal and nothing to fear and something to be very happy to see in your tank, even if it does look a little bit weird initially. All right, I'm going to stop there. I am going to scroll all the way up to the chat and find your questions. And I think at this point we will stick the video on because I hate the background. <laughs> Drives me crazy what it looks like. I just can't, I can't bear it, people. I just can't bear it. So this footage was, sh this was shot in August. And uh, I will do a new one, <laughs> even though it's the end of September, I will do a new one very soon where you guys can see the tank a little bit better. And let me find my picture in picture again. There I am. So this is what the tank looked like a month ago. Not much has changed. Um, it's uh, looking pretty nice. I'll put myself in this corner today. So we're going to put the questions down here at the bottom of the screen. And look, I've, I've paid attention 
when I start running a video, it puts me on mute. I unmute myself almost instantly. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, what intensity do you have your power heads at? Um, I believe they're running around 80%. I typically, I mean, my favorite flow pattern with the Vortex is Reef Crest, but I used EcoSmart Live a long time ago to set them, and I, I chose like five different modes, you know, around the 24 hour period. And so it goes through different parts of the day. There'll be a Lagoon period, there is the Reef Crest mode, there is Tidal Export. Um, I, there's, I never look at the tank and think, oh, it's in such and such mode. I can't even tell. Visually, I can't see it. But the reef continues to live in spite of me, and I'm very happy with the results. And uh, I don't think anything is over 80%. I think that's the maximum of all flow in the tank. And then the uh, flow accelerators, they're random flow accelerators, the RFGs. And these are a product that are 3D printed by uh, Antonio Guterres uh, Vivid Creative Aquatics, VCA, and he prints he printed them and he got them patented and his patent got approved. So it's literally his invention. So what it does is the water goes through the nozzle and as it pushes water out, it actually will go this way and then that way and then this way and then that way. And it, it actually goes five different directions. And in his, when he sets up a booth at a trade show, he has a big piece, you know, he has the nozzle here and he has a big piece of egg crate right here with a bunch of these little fans connected on there. And as you just watch the flow happen, you'll see this fan spins, and then this fan spins, and this fan, and then this one, and then this one, and then down here, and then up here, and then over here. It's really neat. And when you put your hand in front, you can actually feel the change on your palm as it's hitting different parts of your palm. So it's, a, it's another way to have some nice random flow. But if you want to go even crazier, you could then put the actual pipe coming down into your tank on a sea swirl that then pivots the nozzle that has the random flow. So it's sweeping back and forth very slowly I don't know, 30 seconds to make a complete turn. And while it's moving, it's shooting water different directions and it's pivoting back, so you're really changing it up. And if you have a couple of them on sea swirls, they will actually hit each other and interact and cause chaotic flow in the tank, which is great. Everyone's talking about my beard. This has to stop. <laughs> Someone called me Papa Smurf. All right. Uh, someone, Sleeping Giant says, I'd love to get the Reef Trace sticker, but I don't have Instagram. Did you know that Instagram is free? And you could get it, get the sticker, and then I suppose delete Instagram? <laughs> Or you could just keep it and just follow Mila's Reef and Reef Trace. Those are the only two channels you need to follow anyway. Let's see. <clears throat> okay, let's do this. Hillbelly Reefer says, Is it normal for areas that have been cut or trimmed to have accelerated growth? I regularly frag my acros and growth seems to explode. Um, yes and no. I, I can't say that it constantly encourages growth, but... Usually, like for example, let's say you had a coral that was growing and the tip died for some reason. It got burned by alkalinity, for example, and you trim it because if you don't trim it off, it grows algae and it becomes an eyesore. So you trim it off and sometimes they even put a drop of the glue on the top of the part they cut and the skin grows right over the glue and it's like it never happened. Uh, also, little tiny frags on frag discs, like I was showing you before, they often have the most explosive growth of all because it's one little piece and it's just full of color where when you get a big colony, it seems like just the leading edge is really pretty, but the rest of the colony is just kind of just the colony. It's not as pretty. But uh, I'm not a regular pruner of corals, as you probably well know by now. I tend to <clears throat> put the corals in the tank and leave them alone and let them grow. And then once in a blue moon, I'll have to cut something because it collapsed <clears throat> or... It's just so darn big, I fly in someone from Seattle to help me to attack the tank because I don't want to cut my corals. But uh, yeah, I, I've known one guy, he had a beautiful reef tank. He was up in North Fort Worth and he had a like a pear-shaped colony and an apple-shaped colony and a softball-shaped colony and a tabling colony and everything was perfect. It's like every one of those corals knew their proper shape. And I just said, how are you doing this? Because I've never seen this in anyone's tank before. And he said, well, I work on my tank 
every night for two hours. <laughs> so he was kind of like bonsai reefing and making sure they held a certain shape, I guess. And it was fantastic. And it wasn't long after we saw that beautiful reef tank that he'd been keeping for several years, and he was growing and sawing a lot of frags at the club meetings, he ended up opening up a fish store and uh, continued to show off his skills in the store for his customers, which was really nice. Uh, Nick Walter says, I had a Bali slimer that had a really nice blue color in the body that contrasted well with the green polyps. I can't find much info about it, why it went blue. I think you need to look up lime in the sky, Acropora, and I think that's your answer. I think what you have is the limer, not the slimer. Uh, Chase says, I, don't, I love lobos, but they don't love other corals, um, though they can be sensitive to damage, which you typically do for lobophilia placement. My tongue coral kills anything that falls on it. Wow, okay. My tongue coral is just kind of, I mean, you can see in this video in the lower right corner, that big giant long thing in front of the green stick. Uh, that thing is at least 12, 14 inches long. Um, the other day it was fluffed up and it was trying to move, but it has nowhere to go. Uh, I've only seen it like kill stuff because it rubbed on it. Like it kind of eroded some of the chalice. But I haven't seen it like actually reach out and murder anything. And I haven't dropped anything on it either. But Lobos are really pretty, but they do kind of have like a, a sting to them. Uh, underneath me, right there, is a Lobo with the green and orange. And then right there underneath me is a Metallic Cephastria. And I noticed that the edge of the Metallic Cephastria, where it's near the Lobo, is white. So obviously the Lobo decided to have a snack one night. Uh, Chase, no, I'm sorry, Jesse... Chatter says, I have a wonder if you have an opinion on frag plugs. I'm new to the hobby, can't decide whether to remove the frag plugs and glue or leave the frag plugs on their frags on their plugs. It's really a choice. Like, what do you want to look at in your tank? Like I said, some seasoned hobbyists, they like to just snip off the frag and plant it on the rock work. And that way you just see coral on rock and there's no weird circle. I actually have a bucket of frag plugs in here of all different shapes and styles, including ginormous ones. And uh, I've got these smaller ones that have a base on them. This one here is it, oh, by the way, this is a cool fry plug. So this has got like a weird notch in it. It's actually uh, designed to fit inside egg crate and it has some holes. Oh, let's see if I can do that. You can see the holes in the plug. There's the notch. See, it's hollow. It's very, very light. This allows you to cut off the base if you needed to later on. But the reason there's holes in there is so you can put a gargonian in there, put a drop of glue, and then put the frag plug into the rock work. And then here is kind of like a little cradle that you could put underneath something. For example, a clam could sit in this possibly to kind of keep it face up. Um, trying to think what else I'd put in this. I like things that kind of look normal. You know, just kind of that color of the rock work. This was obviously painted and colored. And they actually put a notch right there in the part here so you can snap it off with pliers and get rid of the bottom part. And then you could set this in the bottom of your tank uh, on the substrate or on the sand, on the, the glass bottom of the aquarium. And then I have one. I wanted to get these a while back. So this is really neat. This is a little nugget. This came from a... Uh, from, uh, Real Reef, I think, and they sell a bucket of nuggets. And you can actually put a zoanthid on here, glue it to here, and then set it in the tank and it won't move. And you can have a bunch of these things, which would be really, really cool. So I would uh, recommend things that blend in and aren't visible, or if you can't stand the look of a lot of circles all over your rock work, get rid of the five plugs. Long answer to a very quick question. Uh, Random Hip Hop says, does the Coral Quarantine Tank still need a cleanup crew? No, uh, I keep the tank running. I make sure to top it off so that the salinity doesn't change. But if there's nothing in the tank, I don't even have the light running. And with no light, there's no algae growing in it. And I will actually drain the tank of old water and take reef water to refill the quarantine tank. So, you know, like if you're doing a water change and you're not doing a dirty water change. If you're just draining clear water out of the tank, you can just take the hose from one tank, go right into the quarantine tank and have nice clean water. Uh, I like to have a piece, one or two pieces of live rock in there that stay there for the rest of their life. And then when the coral is in there, I have the light on a timer to activate it, to give light to the coral. 
but I don't put the cleanup crew in there because I just don't, I haven't run into that problem. I never had like a quarantine tank just filled with hair algae. I don't know why. Maybe because I never fed that tank. <laughs> you know, with corals, we don't tend to feed corals, especially corals in quarantine, right? So maybe that's why. And then occasionally if I got a fish, it went in there. But I never had an algae problem in those tanks. Uh, Stephen Ray Reeves says, what are sea spiders? If you go to my Critter ID section, somebody found a little tiny, very wiry spider on his Acroplora, and it was doing damage. And I loved it, you know, that this that he found this and got such a good picture. So I stuck it on my Critter ID page, so you'll find it in there. Uh, Dave says, have you ever considered culturing and selling corals? <sighs> it's the last thing I want to do. <laughs> I haven't considered it. I mean, uh, I really haven't. You know, I've had a couple friends say, don't you dare, because they said I'd be miserable. You know, people are never happy, and they, they complain about everything. They complain that it didn't arrive in time. They complain it doesn't look like what they saw in the picture. They complain it's not this, you know, it's the totally wrong coral. Or they lie and say it died when it didn't, and they keep it, and then they uh, reverse charge on you, and you end up losing money. So, I mean, I've heard all the horror stories. None of that sounds appealing to me. I guess if I were to ever sell corals, I guess I'd grow and sell them locally. Um, I don't know, maybe I could sell them to a fish store, maybe I could sell them to hobbyists, maybe I could bring frag swaps. But all of that just sounds like more work, and it's not like I have tons of free time. I always find myself busy with just doing what I do already for a living. So, I mean, it would be really cool if my frag tank had a whole bunch of corals growing from the reef. So if anything bad happened in my reef, I have starters, but uh, I still haven't got to that point, even though I thought about it just as a backup, like a bank. Uh, James says, I have, hang on, says, I have a BioCube 32 with an LED. Do you think that's enough light for the easier SPS such as Montipora? Maybe Montipora and Bird's Nest and Pacillopora would be okay under that light. I don't know the exact LED fixture in there. I'd have to see it and uh, or learn more. But off the top of my head, just the, the easiest SPS corals would probably be okay. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Reef Buster says, I just got some corals from Worldwide Corals today. I plan on doing some Aptasia X treatment in the tank and doing a water change. Can I add the coral before that or wait till after I'm done with the water change? Um, oh, let me put this on the screen again. I didn't realize how large these were. Let me make it fit the screen. That would help. Um, I think... I think I would focus on the new corals first. The water change, I mean, especially if you're doing regular water changes, I wouldn't uh, worry about the new, I'd take care of the new coral, get them dipped, get them in the tank, um, make sure they're nice and happy, and then perform your water change. I think I would do that. Because if the corals are sitting waiting, they're just kind of at risk, where once they're in your, your tank, they're safer. And thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Um, T.O. Dora says, yesterday I wrote in the Facebook group, which is this amazing group you guys should be a member of. Where's my thing? Where's my promotional information? Right here. Club Meal of Reef. It's on Facebook. We have 8,000 members. So, T.O. Dora said, I wrote yesterday on the Facebook group about sarcophyton spawning. I got the answer. It's a sign the coral's healthy, but it messed up all the tank. In effect, even my fox face didn't survive it? That's strange. So you're saying the spawning event actually killed some livestock? Because normally the eggs or the sperm going to the water column just obscure it, but it's food for everything else in the tank. Now you said your fox face didn't survive it. So the fish just went to the bottom and gasped its last breath and died. I mean, it's possible that there was just so much in the water, but normally that's not a factor. We have corals spawning in our tanks many times when we're asleep. The lights are out. We aren't even aware of it. It happened. The skimmer took care of it. And the next day, you're looking at your protein skimmer, and there's something new in there that you're not used to seeing, but everything else is completely normal. But I am sorry to hear that you lost some life. Coral spawning is completely normal. It's actually a great sign that the, that the system is well-balanced and that the corals are doing well. It could just be that that coral was too big for the aquarium it was in, not enough water volume. If you are in a situation where you're able to observe it like you did and you took the pictures and video that you shared with us, I would then say that it would be smart to uh, add an air stone to the tank, possibly clean the protein skimmer so it's being very efficient to remove that stuff, capture it in a filter sock, 
or uh, even possibly do a water change, you know, like a 25% water change that night. But uh, I've, you're probably one of the first people I've ever heard that said because of a spawning event, things died in the aquarium. That's very unusual. So I'm really sorry to hear that. And I'll turn this back off. But uh, please do join. Uh, there's about 97 people waiting to be added. I'm going to add them today to Club Meals Reef. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do join. The group has one rule, and that is to treat people nicely. And if you're rude, if you're obnoxious, if you're uh, aggressive, you're not going to be there. And it's basically a one and done. So just be nice. If you're having a bad day, don't even visit the group because you don't want to risk losing access to a group of people that are willing to help you with questions all day long, every single day. Uh, Green City Aquatics says, is it okay to put a four inch cabbage leather in a 14 gallon tank with euphilia? I'm worried the cabbage leather is releasing toxins that will cause stress to the other corals. Cabbage leathers, like all the leathers, leathers have the ability to, uh, to um, shed in the tank and that can land on other corals and cause a little bit of chaos. It's a 14 gallon tank. Kind of thinking you're tight on space. Maybe not. I, maybe that isn't a good coral to put in your tank. The reason being is the cabbage will get bigger and bigger and take up more and more real estate. And then other things you might want to put in the tank just are no longer an option because there's just nowhere to put them. So I think I would hold off. But if you have it already or if you're about to get it and if you really love it, then running fresh carbon on the tank would be best. It's a 14 gallon tank. So uh, you would need a quarter cup of carbon in a small reactor where the water flows through the carbon, not just in a bag lying in the bottom. It literally goes through a little tiny reactor where water's going through the carbon and it's removing the toxins from the water. And you can do that every week or every couple of weeks. The bigger the leather, the more carbon you need to run. Um... Mojave says, what is the cabbage cauliflower looking coral in the center of your tank under the Madame Majica sign? That is the cactus pavona coral, and I've had it forever. I grew it from a little tiny chip. There's actually more chips down on the sand bed down beneath in this video right now that's playing <laughs> down there. Um, you can see the cactus pavona. Underneath it is a uh, lithophylon, and under that is some more of the cactus pavona. Uh, Toby Juan Kenobi, <laughs> nice, says, can you explain how Polyp Lab has such a long work time? It was explained at Macna, but I can't recall. It was really cool, though. Um, I think he's talking about the glue that I like. And it doesn't turn hard very quickly under salt water. It gives you some time to work with it. You can actually take the entire tube and put it under water and squeeze the glue onto the rock if you wanted. But I prefer to do my gluing, like, on the frag. I will take the frag itself gently in my hands with a glove so I don't have oils in my skin on the coral and I blot the bottom of the coral where it was against a frag plug so it's dry, and I put the glue on that, and then I put the coral on the rock, and I hold it for about a minute, and then I gently let go, give it another minute or two, and then I wave my hand back and forth, and if the frag doesn't move, I'm good. And if it does move, then I have to re-glue it. But um, I don't know about super long work time. Nothing comes to mind in that for me. It just seemed pretty normal. But uh, I can always ask them and see if I can get some more information for you. Also, be aware that it is possible creatures in your tank may try to eat the glue, which can be very scary for you. For example, you may have a, um, a yellow tank swimming around with her mouth glued shut, or a fox face, or you could see an emerald crab whose pinchers are now glued together, <laughs> you know, like glued shut, and the glue will break off, it will come away, and, and the, uh, the animal usually will survive without any incident. But sometimes they get very curious what you're doing and they will go nibble on it. And while the glue is very fresh, they can actually glue their mouth shut. And it's gonna be really hard to catch that fish who's already freaking out about the glue to try and catch it to peel off glue. So normally we just let it go and give it a little time and the stuff works off and they get their mouth open. Uh, Reefkeeper says, I guess I should be wearing gloves. I hate wearing them. Can't feel anything and I always get glue on them. Well, the benefit of getting glue on the gloves is you can peel the glove off and there's no glue on your hands.
The next question I found is from Ben Presley. He says, what light fixture would you recommend for a rectangular 75-gallon aquarium? I'm having trouble finding the right one. <clears throat> well, there's so many choices these days. Um, I, I like the Radions, and you could put two over the 75-gallon, so you're covering all four feet. Uh, there is the new... Um, the newer Kessel light. The AP700 is the one I tried out and I liked a lot. It worked great on a four-foot tank, but they have a newer model that came out a few months ago, and it's a little more fancy. It works with an app to control. That might be ideal for your your 75-gallon um, aquarium. Uh, the Kessel 360s, uh, the 360Xs, two of those over the tank would probably look really nice and very sleek. The light looks like a hockey puck, and uh, it just it's so minimal <laughs> that I love the look. And when I go to the trade shows, when we had them, and you saw the tanks, they all had those Kessel pucks. I'm like, man, that looks so good. I just want to throw it over my tank. But um, that would be those are some names that come to mind that I like. And there's probably plenty more brands I'm not even aware of. So um, those are the few that are the top of my list of what I'd recommend. Oh, cool. Uh, Michael says it's not true about the NPS tanks being cloudy. It eh, could be. that It's just I saw the tank when they were feeding or whatever. But uh, there is a guy on um, Facebook. His name, his first name is Lamb. He's based out of Phoenix. And his entire reef tank is just this monster NPS system. And he is growing everything we all want. And his water is crystal clear. And he's using daylight lighting. He doesn't use the blue lights at all. And it's so pretty. And he has these crazy looking gorgonians that are spread out like a giant fan. But... The core is yellow, and it goes to orange, and then it's red. It's like it's like someone colored it with crayons. It's like, where did you find that? And he goes, oh, I got the hookup. <laughs> uh, he definitely has the hookup. He is finding some fantastic pieces. And he had the Rizzos. He had Sun Girls. He got this new Sun Girls, the wrong color, and everyone debated that it was dyed. I think they were blue. And uh, he scraped off some of the tissue just to see if it was going to be you know, orange or something underneath. And when it healed, it healed blue. And he says, nope, it's really that coral, which is amazing that we've never seen one before now. So I'm really surprised. But yeah, it is possible to have clear water, but most people don't because they're so, they're heavy, they're feeding so heavily that the water always has that cloudy, murky look. Let's see. <laughs> G unit says, can you talk about the absolute best way to cycle a brand new tank? Uh, it depends on how long you're trying to wait. The normal method I use takes about three to four weeks using a raw shrimp you throw in the tank. There's a new kit that came out from Brightwell that I sell in my shop. That's a dry rock starter kit that includes the ammonia and the fuel that you need to actually have an eight day cycle. And it, and it even includes a microbacter clean to help the rocks not go through the ugly phases for the next couple of months. And that kit is like $35, and uh, it, it's based for a certain tank size. So, I mean, if you have a big tank, you'd need a couple of kits. But, you know, it, I can't remember the tank size it's recommended for, but that kit has been very popular for people that want to set up a tank and get it cycling and not have to wait too long. And I thought, eight days, that sounds pretty nice. Uh, Luis says, and thank you very much for the super chat, he says, how long does the bond of an acrylic aquarium last? I found a 45-gallon acrylic tank in my parents' storage. It's never been set up. It's probably 15 years old. Is it safe? Well, if it's never been used, the best thing you can do is put some water and see what it looks like. Um, I would probably set it up on something so it's very well supported, not like leaning on a couple of sawhorses, like a solid surface, even if it's a sheet of foam on the concrete outside. Put the tank on there, fill it up with water, leave it alone for a day or so, and then really inspect the seams with your eyeballs and see what they look like. The problem I'm having with the, with the idea of this being in... Well, you didn't say... you. For some reason, you said parent storage. My brain th immediately went to attic. And I was going to say the acrylic might have been baking in the attic, and that concerns me. But you know, I don't know what kind of conditions it was stored in. A, a room that has nice temperature, a hot garage, you know, I don't know. But you want to really look at the seams and see how they look. But in theory, acrylic seams last forever because they are the two pieces of acrylic have been welded into one, and they're all one piece now. Now they do fail, but uh, I would just do a water test and see what it looks like. And if everything looks good and you have a warm feeling in your heart, you should fill it up and get a reef going.
Um, would keeping frags or corals in my refugium on reverse light cycle help with keeping the pH up? No. Uh, corals and frags of corals, fragments of corals, does not affect pH whatsoever. They don't help it at all. The uh, things that help pH is going to be the lights that are, um, is the uh, macroalgae being lit with lights because the plants are giving off oxygen. The oxygen's in the water column, which pushes the pH up. And the protein skimmer is pushing the CO2 out of the system. And those two things help with it stabilizing pH. But frags in a refugium, no, that won't do it. Uh, Michael Wells says, would you be able to explain what the main difference is between running more white or blue spectrums and how much red plays a part in the reef? I can touch on it. So the reason white light is so popular and has gone way back you know, for a long time, I mean, when you go outside, when you're swimming in the natural reefs, they are under normal light. <laughs> it's, it's all the spectrums, okay, and it's white. And as you go deeper, yes, it's not as bright, except if it's, you know, the sun is directly overhead, then everything is being hit with tons of light. But as the sun moves across the sky and you have less light or if it's a really cloudy day, yeah, it's going to look more in the blues, but that is not the everyday normal reef. And so putting our tanks like my anemone cube right now in this video is very blue. That is not what you'd find in the ocean. It, it, you almost never see that look. Almost never. So... Whites are actually beneficial to everything in your tank and to your the symbiotic zoanthelia that's inside the tissue of all the corals. And if they get too much light, for example, if someone ran their lights 12, 14 hours a day with white light, they would all be exuding this brown stuff. It looks like this brown poop is just coming off in webs. That's the, the coral expelling the excess zoanthelia. There's too much. They can't take it anymore, and they're getting rid of some because they... they they will feel better with less. Um, if the coral gets too stressed, if it really gets too much light, it can actually bleach out completely. And now you have a completely white coral with all the symbiotic zoanthelia gone, but it's still alive for a little while. It's possible it can recover, but it's going to have to be fed with real foods, you know, some kind of liquid foods that it can grab through the polyps to start to grow some new algae within its tissue to kind of get its color back. Um, the blue spectrum has been heavily promoted for the coral sails. I mean, come on, let's be realistic. Everything looks fantastic. It just pops under blue. If you put on the crazy orange glasses I wear sometimes on the stream and you're walking through a trade show, your credit card is on fire. You're just buying stuff left and right. I know that happened to me. I, I just one day was just buying stuff from every other vendor and people were like, wow, what's Mark doing today? It was those stupid glasses. Everything looks so pretty. I couldn't live without that stuff. But I am actually totally fine with buying corals under daylight. <laughs> And I remember I was in Ohio with my friend Ed, who's in the stream. And we were in a greenhouse that had daylight. And I'm looking at rows and rows of frags. And I told Ed, I said, you need that one right there. And he had just set up something like a 550-gallon aquarium or something bigger, 800. I don't know. It was something huge. And he said, really? Are you sure? And he goes like, yeah. He didn't like it. It wasn't glowing. I said, you put that one under the right lights. It's going to be amazing. And so he brought it you know, back to the office where his tank was. And he put it in there. And he says, you were so right. I, I don't think we need the blue light to shop. I think the blue light does push us over the edge a little bit more easily, but it's not mandatory to your corals. I know the corals grow more quickly under white light than they do under blue, and that's not even something. I mean, I, people love to debate this topic to death, but you can't debate it. You have a tank full of blue corals, uh, blue light, you're going to have very slow growth. You'll have growth, but it's going to be very slow. Also, you're not going to see a lot of the flaws that are happening in the tank, and you may not act soon enough. There is a very well-known coral seller here in my area, and he came to my house once, and he just was stunned, shocked, as he looked at my acros in my tank. And he said, I've never seen corals this big in my life. And I was kind of surprised because my corals are not that big. I've seen some fantastic colonies in other people's tanks. I wish I could grow them that big, you know. And uh, I was really, really impressed with their coral growth. And he was just blown away. But he is a heavy coral seller. And he probably had 2,000 frags in his big, huge shallow reef tank only lit with blue and he sold corals all the time and never let anything grow and i just said oh okay i mean i it was just his reaction was kind of surprising me because i would figure anyone that sells that much coral has <coughs> has seen some big colonies but he was really surprised by the size of my corals and then you asked about reds um the red spectrum 
The UV spectrum, these are some choices that we, and, some, and there's a green spectrum. These are included in some light fixtures. And I know that dialing in some of the UV, you can actually make the orange of a clownfish look the correct color, which is really nice. So there is that ability. I don't know that red is that critical in the reef tank, but I do know if you want to switch all your lights to just red temporarily, it's the perfect time for you to really look at what's going on in your tank because from everything I've read, the livestock doesn't see the red spectrum at all. And so they don't retract or retreat like they would when you hit them with a white flashlight. So if you want to use red light to look at your tank and look for pests and, and see nocturnal activity of your animals, you can turn the tank to that crazy look like they're on Mars and you can really enjoy the red. But I don't know that using red in the tank will make much of a difference when it comes to growth. Uh, Mark Waller says, do you turn your pumps down at night to reduce the flow? Not necessarily. Um, my stuff's all on a, whatever it is. It's a pre-programmed schedule and it may slow down some, but I don't want it to be down low. I want the oxygen levels to stay about the same in my tank. And if you slow down everything, your gas exchange is going to go down as well. And while your fish are sleeping, it could actually affect uh, what they're able to breathe. So keep that in mind. Oh, Martin, this is very nice. He says, a hug for you from a Brazilian who accompanies his work in fish keeping. Thank you very much for the teachings. Brazil today has great Aquarius thanks to the shared knowledge. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm happy to help people in Brazil. How far apart would you put SPS frags? Do they sting each other? Can you mount stag sideways as I have a great six inch vertical space? Um, okay, so your SPS corals are slower growers. And they can be near each other initially, and that's why I was recommending pegging to where you can move things as they get larger, because you might have 10 frags on this one nice rock initially, and everything's about one inch, and it's really pretty. But as soon as you start getting closer, you can pull one out and create a nice gap between the, the other two, right? And you can like remove every other one and make space so everything grows out nicely and put those somewhere else in the tank. Growing corals uh, horizontally or vertically Sometimes you get more growth. It, it's something I've seen a few people do in the past where instead of they have a frag plug and then they put a stick right on top and so it just sticks up like this forever, like a finger. <laughs> like a finger! And uh, it just sits there and then eventually you see some tissue puddling out around the base and it kind of covers the plug and then you might see a little bit of a zigzag growth. But sometimes they'll set it on top horizontally and you know they have a drop of glue in the middle and it sits in the rock work. And then you'll get growth, growth, and growth. So you may get more productive growth running a horizontal piece, uh, like taking the stag and lying it down on its side. You can check it out and see how it does for you. Uh, no, 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 says, do galaxias encrust or calcify and grow? Um, I've never kept galaxia, and my memory is telling me you know nothing. So I'm going to say I have no idea. Sorry. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, do you have a picture of your reef when you got started that you can share? You know, I had something on my desktop here, but I might have gotten rid of it. Um, but I'll, I'll try to find something and I'll stick it in Club Mueller's Reef. I do show like seven years ago and then now every once in a while it does happen. But at the moment, I don't have one on my desktop. I can just throw on the screen for you. Oh, thank you. Austin replied. He said, Galaxias create their own skeleton and build out a colony. There is no encrusting. That kind of sounds, I mean, that sounds right to me. I really, I've never kept one. I, I think I knew the Galaxias have sweepers and I just never was interested in getting that coral. Uh, Pappy Reefer says, I have a 45 gallon lightly stocked softy and LPS reef. Uh, what would cause the alkalinity to drop from 8.5 to 6.5 in a week when I added alkalinity? It turned to snow immediately. All right, so <laughs> I have a video on this channel called Let's Talk About Alkalinity, and it's a really long one, at least an hour. Um, alkalinity has to be dosed to the tank every single day, and you're going to have to determine how much your tank needs to maintain that every single day scenario. Then um, let's say, you know, your 45 gallon tank, let's say you need 39 milliliters of alkalinity in your tank every single day to maintain an alkalinity of 8.5, okay? I'm just using a random number. 39 might be pretty close, actually, but um, you want to put that in an area of very high flow. 
So if you have a power head or you have a return pump with a nozzle that's shooting water out, you would take your solution, whether it's in a syringe that you squeeze or it's in a little uh, graduated measuring cup, and you would pour it into that stream of water very slowly for 30 to 45 seconds. You're trickling it in, trickling it in, trickling it in for, like I said, half a minute to a minute until it is completely gone into the system. It won't turn white and crystallize if you go in very slowly, which is one of the reasons why people like to buy dosing pumps, where they can set up a dosing pump and tell it 39 milliliters once a day, and it just drip, 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 drips for whatever it takes, three minutes. And it, again, it has to go in an area of high flow. If you just take the cup and pour it in, yes, it crystallizes instantly. You have a big white patch, and the alkalinity did not even change because it uh, precipitated out instantly. So there was no benefit to doing that. But this is something that reef keepers, we put it in every single day. We usually put in alkalinity and we put in calcium daily. Um, magnesium, not so much. Magnesium tends to stay up. So that would be my suggestion to you is try using it differently than you've been doing and watch your numbers closely and make sure you don't overdose to where you raise the alkalinity crazy high either. You're going to have to stay on top of water testing of the alkalinity regularly until you find that sweet spot. And then let's say the number is always 35. Then you know, okay, my tank needs 35 for now. But two months from now, as the corals get bigger, you might need 37. Then you might need 41 milliliters, maybe 45, you know, but it always has to go in an area of very high flow. Uh, Jeremy says, I can keep anything but Montipora in my tank. I'm coming to the conclusion it might be my Viver Spectra black box. It could be the light. It could be the intensity of the light. It could be the duration of light being on too long per day. It could be you have something that kills Montipora like a fish that eats polyps, uh, a montipore eating nudibranch that is snacking on them, and you may just have to be montipore free for a very long time, and then one day you put it in and everything works out. That happened to a friend of mine who loved montipore, so it could be that. Sizzle Reef says, what is the minimum par you would recommend for an SPS tank? Um, I would say minimum would be 200. Um, they do really well under 400, 500, 600, 800 par. So, I have stuff growing in the bottom of my tank where it's 200 or less, maybe even 150. They were just things I never moved up higher and they continue to live. So it, it's not that the par is absolutely, it's got to be this number, but it is nice to know general numbers. And I would say 300 and up would be a good target. Uh, 500 or so would be really nice. Uh, if it's higher than that and your corals are just screaming with life, then you're doing a good job. Here we go. Reefkeeper said I had a yellow eye coal tang that glued its mouth shut. I was worried, but it came off in about two days. Because the salt water is constantly eroding at it, and so that's what happens. It, and then the, the fish may even kind of like hit its beak, so to speak, its mouth against the rock to kind of knock that stuff off. There was one story. Um, I saw it in a thread a long time ago. I didn't read the whole thread. It was a huge conversation. But this guy had a yellow tang that had a rubber band that went from the mouth around the tail and back. Somehow the rubber band fell in the tank and that tang got caught in it. And he's like, how do I solve this? And I just saw it and I started laughing. I was like, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, Cassie says, this is my first time listening live. I'm a novice reefer. Last weekend I converted my 72 gallon bow front from a canister filter to a sump system. My leather coral is not happy. Well, it could be that the leather coral is not happy because you use glue for the plumbing because you went to a sump, and so there's some of that stuff in the water, but leathers are pretty hardy, and they can usually put up with quite a bit, so I wouldn't be too worried at the moment. It could also just be mere coincidence, and it's just going into its shedding period, and, you know, they do that. They'll be shedding for a while, and then they reopen, and they're happy. The big leather that was in the back of my tank is um, really unhappy right now. It, it tore itself off the rock, and it's kind of on its side, and it just looks like a miserable cantaloupe right now. And I'm going to have to get in there and kind of turn it right side up and see if I can help it feel a little bit better. Or maybe I'll dip it in something. But, um, yeah, it's, it's not been happy for weeks. But congratulations on getting away from the canister filter and going to the sump. So I hope that all your equipment fit the sump and that it's running right and that you've done a test to make sure that the sump will not overflow in the event of a power outage. Because that's a very important test. Anyone who owns a sump should pull the power cord on the return pump and the protein skimmer and stand back and look. And if the sump holds all the water that drains, you set it up correctly. And if it continues to drain and you see the, the sump is getting to the point of overflowing, plug in everything really quick and figure out what you have to change to avoid that from being a thing. And it could be something as simple as lifting the nozzles in your tank a little bit higher up so that they break the surface of the water more, you know, more quickly to prevent 
as much water siphoning down the drains. Uh, Smoky Reefer says, great tip I learned was to put a bit of glue on your finger, then spread it on the rock where your frag is going to go, then put glue on the frag and bond it together. I think Dwayne does that. Um, I, I believe that was one of his things too. I've seen that before. I have not tried it myself because I don't want glue all over my finger, but I guess if I was wearing the glove, it wouldn't even matter. Uh, Toby Wan sent another super chat. Thank you very much and said it doesn't start to get hard until it hits the water. So literally I have blobs on plugs for hours and came back to finish the mounting job. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, I haven't tried that. <clears throat> so, cause I'm not a hardcore fragger like you are Toby Wan Kenobi, but that's really neat. But yes, usually the salt water does activate it, but I had no idea that you could go hours and just the glue would still be soft out in the air that long. That's amazing. <clears throat> Cassie says, where's the best place in the tank to place a leather coral? Um, I'd say about two thirds down in the tank and not in a direct flow of a power head. <clears throat> I think you'll find a spot where it'll just kind of nestle in there and be okay and it'll extend its polyps and it should be happy. But yeah, when you have a change in the tank, your corals are always going to react. They're going to say, hey, things are different than what they were. Uh, Adam says, how high up did you build your rockscape in your tank to allow for all the growth you have? So behind me right now, I guess I'll switch this camera right quick. Turn this to pause. And we'll go to this. So in the tank, the rockwork comes to here. That's all rock and everything above it's coral. So I'm just a little bit more than halfway up. I want to have that open space for the fish to swim, but... Um, Eventually, I had to go back to letting corals grow up higher. And then, like I said, I may actually resort to um, removing corals, cutting off the dead, and lowering everything in the tank. Oh, so let's talk about this. Andy's Reef says, I have a devil's hand finger coral that's come loose. I've tried gluing it to a piece of rock, but it just comes away and floats around the tank. How can I get it to attach to a piece of rock? There's a couple of tricks. Um, you can use a rubber band around the rock. You can use a zip tie. I've seen people take a toothpick and push it right through the leather and into a crevice of the rock to kind of hold it there for a while. You can actually put another rock against it <laughs> and it will glue on to maybe both rocks. You know, that's the other problem. But it's, a, it's not saying you just put glue on. Leathers don't glue they need to grow onto the rock. So you need to do something to secure it temporarily. And if you use like a zip tie or a fishing line or something like that, after the coral is secure, after a couple of weeks, you can just trim away whatever was used as a temporary band-aid and the coral will stay there forever. Bogey Ramirez says, what are some good beginner acropora? Um, I, I would just think the basics. So like a blue tort is a very nice one. The, the green slimer is a very nice one. These are all nicknames. But Acropora tortuosa is uh, a blue tort. And that one is, it's so pretty in the aquarium. It's one of my favorites. And it's fortunately, I've been doing really well. I've had them now for almost two years. That was one of those corals I could not keep alive myself, but I could grow on anything else. Um, I would not buy anything high end. Any frag you can find for like 15, 20, 30 bucks, I would get that before I'd even consider something high-end that costs you 80, 100, 150. Because spending a bunch of money on something when you're beginning and you're learning, there's, you're just gonna lose the money. You're gonna say, wow, I could have just burned that cash with, with a flame instead of putting this coral in my tank. You know, or you could have, or say, I, I could have flushed that money away. I don't know. I would just recommend something simple and affordable um, based on the look of it. You can look at the store and see what they have on the, available on their racks and just buy that sweet little SPS you like. Um, other, you said Acropora, that's why I'm limited. I can't say all the normal things I would say to start with, like Bird's Nest, not Acropora. Bacillopora, not Acropora. Um, what else is there? Um, what's in my tank that's Acropora? Staghorns are good Acroporas. They're usually pretty hardy. They come in a few different colors. Um, one of my favorites is the Eflorensis, Acro Eflorensis, and it tables out with these beautiful tips that come out. Super beautiful, but I would 
pretty much bet if I were to double check that one, that's a higher end, not to mention expert level coral. So I wouldn't push you toward that. So I would just go to the store and see what they have on the shelf, see what's affordable to you and try that out and see how they do. And if you do well for a few months, you could start adding more different ones that you like even better. Uh, Tony says, I'm having trouble with blue lights about a month ago. When I turn the whites on and turn off the whites and let only blues, corals begin to shrink before they open up normally under blues. What could change? I feel like something's... Hmm. Turn off the whites. They would shrink. Um, I don't really understand your question exactly, Tony. I'm sorry, but typically... White light has greater par, more intensity, and blue light has less par, less intensity. You said that when you only use blues, the corals begin to shrink, but they were more open under the whites. Is that what I'm understanding? Could you ask that question again? <laughs> Maybe because I feel like I can't answer it without knowing more information. Uh, Tim B says, is there another blue light product you would recommend that worked very well? Flux or Rex knocks out the Barapsis. Of oh, Blue Life products, I love Phosphate RX. <laughs> that is my go-to. I've been using it for a decade. I love that very much for controlling phosphate. Um, the Flux RX works really good for bryopsis and hair algae. And I'm going to jump to the next question. Lamont says, my phosphates are 0 0.37. Is that too high? Many people will tell you it's too high, but it's really not that high. So 0 0.37 is a little bit up there. When you get to 0.5, I would use Phosphate RX, which I just mentioned, to bring it back down again. Battle OCR says, favorite foods to use on a normal basis, and how many times do you feed your tank uh, per day? Uh, the, the tanks get automatic food from auto feeders twice a day. And it's just a type of flake food I've been using forever. And then the uh, frozen food I use tonight is always Rod's food, mixed with some PE mices, mixed with some mini mices, mixed with some, what else do I put? Oh, krill. And I tear the krill into smaller bite-sized pieces and stuff. I'm big little meaty things go in the tank, I break it up so all the fish get a chance at it, instead of having just like all the krill land on the anemones. And that seems to work out really well, and I do that every single night. So by 10.30, the fish are all swarming, they're all ready for dinner. And then, you know, I'll do nori from time to time, and I also like to um, put in some banana from time to time. That's fun, uh, just for the, the fish, they love banana. I take a piece off the tip of the banana, and I put it underwater, and I rub my fingers together, and it breaks up and goes everywhere. And the tangs chase it, the clowns go after it, the antheas go after it. Um, I've seen um, even the, uh, when I had the flame angel, it was going after it. Everyone seemed to like it. Bravo says, how many hours do you guys recommend for the white lights and blue lights on to promote coral growth to prevent algae growth? Ha <laughs> That's the trick. So basically, if you could have two hours or three hours of white light per day, and then maybe four or five hours of blue light per day, that would be the maximum I would go. I like to have somewhere between a seven and nine hour photo period on the aquarium. My lights start at one o'clock in the afternoon and by 10 they're done. So that would be what I'd recommend. I don't do this whole thing from morning till night. I see no point in that whatsoever. It makes no sense. And especially if you're gone most of the day. So why not start it later in the day while you're at work and then it, um, stays on later into the night while you're at home eating dinner, watching TV, enjoying your tank. So that would be my recommendation. Now to avoid algae growth, it's kind of impossible because you've got fish in there and you're feeding them and you're feeding the corals too, which food and light and uh, phosphate and nitrate promote algae growth. That's why you're supposed to have a cleanup crew to eat all the algae away. So don't neglect your cleanup crew is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Tim says, we see you like Halloween, so tell us what your favorite type of Halloween candy is to get. Well, I am a huge candy corn fan, and I love that every time this time of year, people are like, this belongs in the trash. I love candy corn. I have a whole jar of it right here. It's the good stuff. And uh, I've had to refill this three times this week. <laughs> I'm out of control. It tastes like icing to me. I love it. People say it tastes like plastic. I think you're getting the wrong one. Get the Brock's. It's the best. Um... Movie that scared me the most as a kid. Whew. Um, I'm not a big horror movie fan. 
I'm more about thrillers. I do remember a movie, seeing a movie once. You know, I wasn't a kid, but I saw this movie, and uh, it was with Michelle Pfeiffer, and she was in an apart. She had to go into a dark apartment, and you knew the bad guy was in there. You knew he was in there, and she walks in, and then something makes her jump, and it's the cat, and you're just like, okay, and then I was in the movie theater when I saw this. And then out of the shadow of a doorway, this face just appeared and I jumped out of my seat. Okay, I literally jumped up. I was up in the air and the guy behind me laughed at me <laughs> and I was really embarrassed. <laughs> and at the end of the movie, uh, you know, the credits are running and I turned around and said, so I guess I made you, uh, I made a fool of myself, made you laugh. And he says, do you know why I was laughing? I said, yeah, because I jumped so high. He says, no, because I jumped higher than you did. <laughs> I felt a little bit better. And I mean, I knew the bad guy was in there and yet I still jumped out of my seat when he appeared just out of that shadow. It was very frightening. Um, but yeah, I never got into the whole Jason thing and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, Sounds of the Lambs and all that. Oh, Jeremy says, what's the best coral recommendation for a five gallon nano tank? Only the best, most colorful, tiniest things you can find. I would, especially five gallon tank. You don't want something that grows quickly. You want something that's small and pretty. Uh, you might want a few zoanthids. You might get one scoli, you know, um, you might want a pretty little gorgonian that grows up vertically for looks, but you don't want anything that grows quickly and you don't want things that are going to overgrow and kill their neighbors. So I think it's me more about what looks good vertically, what looks good in the low spot, what would look nice on your rock work, and also what colors complement each other. Because that is so important when you're trying to figure out that you want to avoid. And I, I mentioned, I wanted to mention this earlier, but now we're in the Q and A section. So I feel like, oops, uh, when it comes to coral placement, it's so important that you don't put all the same colors in one spot. If you have all the greens in one spot and all the browns in another spot and all the reds in another spot, your tank looks very monochrome. It's kind of ugly. But when you can mix it up with the contrasting colors, it just really pops and looks really, really nice. So I would uh, encourage you to avoid making that blunder of putting similar colored corals near each other. And then you might have to prune your corals quite a bit to maintain that nice looking five gallon tank. I mean, it's not microscopic, but it's really small. You could put a sun coral in that tank and you could feed it because the tank is so small you just reach in and get your wrist wet <laughs> and feed the sun coral polyps. You'll have to stay on top of water changes in that tank too. Uh, James says, what would you prefer in the back of an all-in-one tank, a skimmer or a refugium? I would want a skimmer in an all-in-one tank. Uh, Adam says, the way you did your return on building a peninsula tank, would it cause too much head pressure to run it up and across the top length of the tank to avoid plumbing being seen five feet long? Yeah, you're going to have back pressure, but you can use larger plumbing across the top of the tank and a big pump to overcome all that head pressure and still get decent return flow. That would be one approach, and you'll always have that pipe in your way when you're working in the tank, which is no fun. But you do what you got to do to maintain the look of the peninsula tank. You might want to put unions or at least one union. So if you really have to work in the tank that day, you can loosen the union, remove that pipe, work in the tank, do your job. When you're done, put the pipe back into place and tighten the union back on. Hush. Want some candy corn? Sorry about that. Let's see. Uh, Lamont says, I got two staghorn frags in my tank about eight months ago. There's no growth. Uh, there's no growth colors there. <laughs> so they're colorful, but they're not growing. Um, and four AI primes on the 75 gallon aquarium. Well, you have plenty of light. Uh, trying a couple of ginormous water changes and see what happens with your tank. It could be that. Sometimes they just need a little bit of fresh water with some nice trace elements to kind of pick up their momentum again. Uh, Arowana 007, like Bond, says, when dosing uh, anything in your tank, should the carbon be taken out? No, uh, you know, the carbon is only good for a few days. Uh, I've got articles about this on my website from a really good author that uh, he gave me permission. So read those. I mean, they're really in-depth. And I read these like, this makes sense to me. And read it. And if you agree with me, you'll, you'll come to that conclusion that they're only good for three days, and then you've got to remove it. And... Uh, so I wouldn't dose anything like Prodibio or Trace Elements or anything on the day 
that I'm actually putting carbon on the tank. I'll do the carbon later. Give me one second here. Alrighty, let's see. Okay, good. Cassie, I'm so proud of you. You tested for a power outage. Good job. That's the kind of stuff we always want to do. Jamie says, I'm looking to change my rock as mine has loads of vermitids, but without creating a cycle. Can I use dry rock and seed it with loads of bacteria in a tub, or will I need to do something more? Well, uh, I feel bad for you. So the vermitids are all over your rock. Um, do you have thousands? Do you have tens? Do you have hundreds? You know, is it something where you can just kind of like focus on one end of the tank and work your way across for the entire week? Or do you really have to swap out rock? Because... I feel badly that even if you were to cure new dry rock and go through the whole process and get it all filled up with bacteria, you're still going to go through all the ugly phases because you're completely redoing your aquascape again. I'd much rather work with what you have now than, say, rip it all out and start all over again. But it really comes down to how bad the infestation is. Even in my reef, I have probably, I don't know, six or ten vermitids. I'm like, okay, whatever. And, you know, from time to time I think, oh, I probably should do something about it. But I haven't. And they've been like this for years. And is there the same ones? There's one over there and there's one down there. I'm like, all right. But, uh, you know, if you've got just a massive situation, the general rule is break them off, cover the hole with a dot of glue so that they can't get out, add some bumblebee snails. Apparently they eat them. Hermit crabs can eat them. You can use a dental tool and you can actually rip the entire tube right off the rock, just pry it off and let it fall to the bottom. And that'll be the end of that because your fish will eat it, your cleanup crew will eat it, you know, or you can just remove it physically and throw it in a bowl and toss it in the trash. But um, I, I really, I feel badly if you want to literally swap out all the rock work. Now, if you hate your aquascape and you're like, I'm looking for a brand, new, a brand new fresh start, then yes, I would fill up a trash can. I'd fill it up with salt water. I'd put the dry rock in there. I would get it circulating. I would add bacteria or do, do the dry rock starter kit and get it all loaded with bacteria. No lights. Just let it do that. Change the water every couple of weeks. And after maybe... Um, a month to six weeks to eight, probably two months. I'd probably wait two months, knowing me. Uh, I would wait about two months, and then I would do the transition. I'd remove all the old rock work, I'd break off all the corals, I'd put the new rock into the tank immediately. It won't cycle because that rock has nothing on it that's ammonia-based to die. You're just going to remove it from the barrel of salt water, put it in your aquarium full of salt water, there's no cycle. And your sand bed still has uh, life in it, and the corals still have life, so you're just going to break off the corals off the rock you're removing, you're losing a lot of beneficial bacteria, but you have some new clean rock. But you might still go through the ugly phases. It's a tricky one. I don't envy you that. Tim, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Boogie Ramirez says, I can grow Montipore and bird's nest like crazy. I just haven't tried acros yet. Well, if you can grow those two, the acros shouldn't be hard for you. I think you'll be good to go. <laughs> Tim, thanks so much. Uh, I could use a drink. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to use that super chat for. Uh, Revo says, has anyone heard the news on the Hanna nitrate checker? Uh, I've heard a couple of people have already started buying it. It is out. Also, I just saw an ad today for Premium Aquatics is selling the Nero 3 pump. Uh, I couldn't find any specs. I really would like to see the Nero 3 next to the Nero 5 to see how much smaller it is. But uh, I, I think it was 149 or 179. Uh, so that's kind of exciting because a lot of us have had the Nero 5 for some time. We were looking forward to the 3. The 3 has got to be smaller. It's going to be made for those smaller tanks. But I'm running one on my 60-gallon tank. Yep, that was Jack. I had to put her in the room. <laughs> she was annoyed that I was paying attention to the screen and not her. Uh, James says, what is your hardest coral to grow or your kryptonite coral? Well, blue tord and green slimer were my kryptonites. And... Green Slimer technically is, because I don't have any. <laughs> uh, the Blue Tort was, I could not keep alive, and I've had, I've got two or three different little colonies growing in the tank that are a couple of years old, still going strong. Even with the big RTN event that I talked about, 
um, about what eight weeks ago that took out a massive colony that was sad uh, the blue tort did not get hurt thank god right but uh, I don't have any green slimer I have lime in the sky which was sold to me as a slimer but it's not so it'd be nice to get that one that would be probably my uh... and then I haven't had any luck with Walt Disney which everyone loves Walt Disney and I had one piece and it just basically turned green and I don't know maybe I should try that one Reefkeeper says, have you ever had phosphate erects not bringing down phosphate? One of my tanks is sitting at 0.11 PO4, and dripping the recommended dose doesn't seem to bring it down. I'm using lanthanum calc. Oh, you're using calculator. Um, well, you're already you're very low on phosphate, so it, it doesn't have much more to bring down. That's why you probably didn't see much result. If the water turned cloudy at all from the dose, then it did its job, but it may not do as much as you want. I usually go from a high number to a low number. <laughs> I've been doing it like that forever. And I, I need, I, like I said, I want, at the beginning of the stream, I was wanting to test before the stream. But my tank has been completely on autopilot for the last few weeks. I've done nothing but clean the glass and make sure everything's running. Um, and nothing else. I mean, nothing. It's been great. And I'm looking, I'm seeing all this new growth. I'm like, oh, how nice is that? But I want to measure my water and see where everything is and make any course corrections that are necessary to keep everything continually healthy because that's how it's supposed to be. But I think your phosphates are just so low you know, 0.1, that's a tenth of a part per million. It's just not enough to worry about. That number is a perfectly fine number to me. I know people like 0 0.03, but 0 0.1, totally fine. I wouldn't even sweat it. If you get to 0 0.5, 0 0.75, then you use phosphate or X and knock it back down to 0 0.1 or maybe less. Uh, out of this entire year, only one time did I test my phosphate and it was 0 0.03. And I was like, woohoo! <laughs> and then the next week it was, you know, whatever, it was higher. Oh, I have a picture to show you guys. I took a picture of the uh, anemone cube today, right before the stream. So it probably won't fit this screen, but we're gonna try it here. Let's see. Nope, that's me. How do I get to? Oh, here we go. So here is the anemone cube, and uh, I did a little cleaning on it yesterday. I cleaned the. I hate vertical pictures, right? I cleaned the glass on all three sides. And I actually siphoned the sand bed specifically to suck out a bunch of Aptasia that were bothering me. So here's the cube again. And I think that was it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, tank looks really good today. And that was, again, early this, this morning. Now it's kind of more in the 10K mode. Kind of close. All right. Let's wrap up with a few more questions and then get into water testing and then end the stream for today. Uh, Daryl says, I'm starting a zoa garden. Do I have to worry about certain zoas growing over other zoas? Uh, the palithoa, the pallies, are a bigger polyp. They oftentimes will stand taller, be wider, and could actually kind of uh, smother the smaller, finer microzoas that we like that are so colorful. So the trick is having enough space between them to where you have a little cluster and cluster of sort of like little bouquets of zoanthids. That would be nice. There's a, a guy, never remember his name, has a YouTube channel and a and holla, holla at you boy. Look up that guy. He's got some amazing zoanthids and you could maybe get some inspiration from looking at his tank. Uh, smoking reefer says how many fish do you have in your reef and what singular animal turns your sand over the best oh i think the reef tank has somewhere close to 30 fish in it 11 are the skunk clown fish there's five tangs there's uh, five pajama cardinal fish three antheus copper band um i don't know it's i think that's the list of fish at this time and then sand bed stays clean probably from the hermit crabs walking across it I have cucumbers and I have a, a serpent starfish or two in there, but I think the hermit crabs are the ones doing the most work. Steven says, do you have to worry about yellow tangs when using phosphate RX? I've got two yellow tangs and they've been through it 50, 60 times and they've never cared. But other people say it does. So that's a tricky one. I wish I had the answer to why it's a problem for some people. I always dose at night while the fish are asleep. Maybe that's the difference. 
I do know that you can buffer up alkalinity about 20 minutes before you dose. That's a, like an extra precaution. You could try that and see if that would help. But someone else recently posted in Club Meals Reef, and they said how they've been using phosphate Rx for some time now, and their fish have been through it over and over and over, and the latest dose they put in, the yellow tang was struggling or died. I was like, why? What changed? What is different? And we couldn't figure out what, what she did differently than any other time before. And she says, I don't understand, and neither did I. Um... Ron says, as for the reef calculator, I need to use 81 milliliters to raise calcium from 400 to 440. Can I add it all at once to my 24-gallon aquarium? Uh, FYI, the RODI worked perfectly. Uh, I would add it gradually, maybe twice that day. Like, if you're using 81 milliliters, use 40 in the morning and 40 in the evening. Just kind of break it up and pour it into an area of very high flow so it mixes as it's trickling in ever so slowly into your tank. And then your calcium probably will kind of stay where it needs to be. Um, you may need to put in a maintenance dose of 15 or 21, I don't know, I'm picking random numbers out of the air, of calcium every day to maintain 440. The only way to know what your tank is needing is to keep measuring the water, which leads us to what I always say to do is water test Saturday. So we test our water on Saturday, we post our results online, we share them with our friends and inspire our fellow reef keepers to do their water testing. And we want to break out those test kits. We don't want them to expire from being not used because they don't last forever. And we want to know what is going on with our tanks. So if you are dosing anything, you have to test to make sure your dose is correct. And if you're not measuring, if you're just looking at the tank saying everything looks fine, you're going to have a bad day one day, I promise you. There is just no way to look at a tank and know how it's doing without a full inspection. And our inspection involves testing the water. So it's just the necessary evil, just like cleaning a protein skimmer, taking apart a pump, cleaning the glass. This is one part of what we do to keep our tank healthy. Um, Tony says, since about a month ago, my corals seem to go to sleep when I turn off the white lights. Uh, they're only open when the blue lights are on. I think that they're shriveling up because the white lights are so intense. That's what I think is happening. And so when the blue lights come on, they have less par. The corals kind of open up because they're they're not being beaten down. So if you're using white, use less percentage. Use it for less long, you know, like an hour, hour and a half. You can start off with 30 minutes for every day for a week and then go to 45 minutes every day for a week and then an hour every day for a week, hour and a half every day a week. I don't know why something changed a month ago, but some kind of setting apparently changed and maybe your, your white intensity is at 100% when it always was at 62%, and you just never noticed that slider got bumped. I don't know. <clears throat> but it totally sounds like they are cringing from the bright white, and then they're opening up for the blue because the blue isn't nearly as intense, which is 100% normal. White light is one strength, and blue light's another strength, and white will always supersede blue, which is why you get coral growth from white light. Uh, Debbie, I saw your post on Club Miller's Reef about this. Her husband surprised her with a second tank. It's a 60-gallon tank that's running with fish and corals. So she says, any advice on moving it and setting it up without loss? It's only about 45 minutes away. Well, it's 60 gallons. It's a lot of water to move. Uh, the livestock, I would use two or three trash cans, uh, nice clean ones that are only used for aquariums, and I would suck out the water out of the tank, you know, to fill up the trash can a third of the way, and I would pull the rocks out that are in that cube, and I'd put them in the trash can. And now you've got a trash can with a handle on each end, so you and your husband can grab each end and get it out to the car or hopefully a truck and put it in the back. And then you come inside with another trash can, you siphon out some more water, and now the water is only this deep in the tank, and you can scoop all the fish out, and you can put them in that trash can. You're going to want to put um, an air pump in there. You're probably going to put a heater in that bucket for as soon as you get home because you got to set up the tank again. That takes longer than 45 minutes. The drive is 45 minutes, but it's everything you do after you walk through the front door that delays how long it takes the fish to get into the tank. And you don't want the water in the trash can or the bucket to cool off. And uh, the corals can be basically on top of the live rock. The sand that's in the tank, if it's more than six months old, you need to remove it and wash it out completely, get all the detritus out. And now the nice rinse sand, you can put that back in the cube. You can put the cube on its stand, you can put the sand in. And I would say have plenty of salt water ready. I know you said in your post how much salt water do you have ready because I'm um, surprising with a tank. 
that's good. It's nice to have 25, 30, 40 gallons of salt water in addition to whatever you need in case anything weird comes up. And then when you're setting up the new tank, you know, the, the new when you're the new used one, you're gonna take the rock that's in the barrel of salt water after you got the corals out of the way and you're gonna shake it off in there to get the detritus out of it and then put it in the tank. Get the next one, shake it off in that salt water, put it in the tank, and stack up the rock work. And then you can put all the corals down on the sand bed initially if you want. Uh, you can put them in place. Then you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the power heads come on and work properly. You wanna make sure any pumps are working properly. You're going to want to make sure the light fixture is affixed properly. And then you can introduce the fish. And then you're done. It was the longest day of your life. But if you do everything right and you stay on top of water testing every single day for the next week, you can avoid any kind of uh, disasters. The biggest thing you want to avoid is ammonia. And uh, that can happen from exposing the rock to air, which is why you put in a trash can of salt water, even for that short drive. And also you can put some prime in the tank. That's completely reef safe. And one capful does 50 gallons. You can put a couple of capfuls in that 60 gallon tank and it will help lock up ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, ammonia, uh, chlorine, chloramine. I mean, it locks up everything. It's some weird elixir. Works really well. <laughs> Carter, how can I help you? Best way to learn which fish won't attack each other. My tank is like World War III. Uh, uh, that's a whole other stream, buddy. But uh, first thing you want to look for online is the fish compatibility chart and start reading who gets along with who to learn what's right. You may have to remove something. You might just have a super aggressive fish in that tank that went in first and everything you've added since has just added to this World War III scenario. And when one fish is aggressive, all the other fish pick up on that stress hormone and they all become aggressive with that one. So you may have to figure out who the ringleader is and remove them. Uh, you could try putting a divider like egg crate, you know, the lighting diffuser stuff in the tank to make it into sections with these fish where they can see each other but can't touch each other and then gradually remove them and see if they can start tolerating each other again. I don't know. I don't know what you got, but it sounds like quite the mess. Uh, Joe says, what's your opinion on skill rating with certain things? What makes the skill level? 20 years, understand the needs of the animal, the willingness to go out of your way for to care for it? Very good question, and I think it kind of ties in with my live stream I did a few weeks ago called Let's Talk About Tank Maturity, because it's really about the hobbyist maturity and what they've learned, and, and they're less <clears throat> prone to reacting. They are more prone to being patient and working the problem. I think that's part of the skill level. I mean, there are certain things that literally, yes, experience will help you far more. And we should literally not buy something because we don't have enough skill. I mean, there, that we have to be humble in that regard. There are certain things we just don't know. But uh, it'd be nice to say, I, mean, I don't think 20 years is going to be required for like expert level fish. But I think if you've maintained a reef tank successfully for five or six years, you could potentially look at considering getting, you know, the higher end or uh, the uh, <clears throat> expert level livestock, possibly. And even then, you may fail at it. So it, it really comes down to what exactly is the item? Is it a coral? Is it a fish? Is it an invertebrate? What exactly is it you're wanting? What are its exact needs? Does your tank even come close to matching those needs? And if it doesn't, I would just look the other way. <laughs> I was like, that's nice. Next. And I would just ignore it. But... Um, I think the skill levels are there really to help people that are brand new in the hobby understand they shouldn't be getting this yet because we don't want, we want everything we buy to live and thrive. And if we are jumping the gun with a lack of knowledge, then um, invariably we're going to lose the livestock and we're going to lose money. We're going to get frustrated. We might even leave the hobby all because we did not get enough personal tank maturity in ourselves. Um, and then Joe continues his question saying, what if you've been in the hobby for a while and you know your way around the tank? At some at that point, what makes it where it's difficult to keep, like a carpet anemone? Um, really, it's, I think the best thing you could do, like let's say this exact thing, the carpet anemone. You know you've read it's difficult to keep, like a red carpet, for example. And those things are like $800 too. So I would find other people that have one and start asking them questions about what has allowed them to keep one successfully long-term. How long is long-term? Have they had it three months, three years, 30 years? You know, I mean, this is where you're, you want to know 
what they're doing to see if you are the same type of hobbyist. And if you can get some uh, basic information from two or three people that have kept that exact species, you're ahead of the game. I mean, obviously you can buy books on this topic and read, you can watch YouTube videos on this topic and, and watch. Um, I just think it's more, these expert items should never be impulse buys. They should be, I've done my homework, I've done my research, I'm prepared for this, I understand there's going to be a challenge. And don't just go in with the attitude, I hope it'll work out. You have to basically go in and say, this will work out. I'm going to do, like you said before, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make this work. But it has to be, whatever you're going to do has to be within what's natural. You can't force it. You can't become God yourself and break all the rules of science to make something live. You know, that, that's impossible and that you're going to fail. But if you say, well, I've got the right flow, I've got the right lighting, I've got the right space, I understand I might lose some fish to this carpet and enemy because they eat fish, and you're like, I want it, then yeah, you should give it a shot. Uh, Bravo says, what is the best thing to feed your corals and how often? Well, um, so many choices, but I really love Bene Reef. And Bene Reef is this dry food that you mix with tank water, let it sit for five minutes to activate the bacteria in it, and you can just pour it in the reef and everything gets a snack. And the fish go crazy, but they can't eat it because it's so fine. It's such a microscopic plankton-sized food, but all the polyps in your tank, every single, the millions of little mouths, they all get a bite, which is great. You can use that two, three times a week, and the best part is your glass stays clean longer, which is the weirdest side effect, and I love it. So I do recommend that one, and the beauty of it is, even if you use that food too much, you don't end up with cyanobacteria, which is a miracle. That just tells me, I mean, that's the food I like to promote, because I'm not saying you can use this food, but you're going to have cyano. You can use this food, but you get paralysis. You know, it's like literally you can put this in your tank, and you don't have to stress or worry, and it doesn't do anything weird. It doesn't collapse your skimmer to where your skimmer doesn't work later. It doesn't make the skimmer turn into a volcano later. It's just a really good food product. And it's just so important that you let it activate in salt water for five minutes before you pour it in the tank. And if you want, you can make it a slurry and put it in a ketchup bottle, and you can squirt it at certain corals if you want a target feed, too. So that's really nice. Joe, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't have any picture. Uh, I don't really have a picture handy right now of Jack. I'll, I'll get you guys one later. Ian says, um, any idea why my red Montipore digitata has started to lose its red color, but all my other acros are doing fine? Any help, please? I would check your magnesium level. Montipore love magnesium, and I like to keep that number about 1,400 ppm. So if your magnesium is lower, that could be why they are looking less colorful. Uh, the other thing could be that you have a fish like a flame angel or coral beauty nipping at the polyps and they're closing up and so then the coral will naturally fade because it's not feeding like it used to so those are the two things that come to mind and the montipora as you know is not an acropora so saying my acros are fine has nothing to do with the montipora your montipora just needs something and probably needs more magnesium lamont thank you very much for the super chat Uh, Flight Tracker 2 says, I have a Fluval 13.5 gallon tank, mostly softies. I've been using the ABI Tuna Blue PAR 38 bulbs for four years. I'm switching to the Kessel A360X shortly. Any suggestions to avoid shock? I would say put the light up higher than you normally would, and you're going to use the app to control the uh, lighting. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at how simple it's going to be. Number one, your corals are softies. Uh, you can run the lights shorter period. Like normally you're running these PAR 38 bulbs and you're probably running them 9, 12 hours a day or something. You can run the, the Kessel for maybe four hours a day and then after a week bump it up to four and a half hours a day and then after another week bump it up to five hours a day and you'll avoid light shock. But these things also allow you to turn them down to a lower intensity so you could have a longer day. You could have it ramp up and then have four hours of strong light and then ramp down again and then spread out the intensity. But softy corals are not demanding, so I think you won't have too much of a shock situation there. Just uh, 
consider it's an acclimation period, and so you want to run less intensity initially. And then after about eight weeks or so, you're going to be pretty much back to what would be considered the full lighting period of your day at the normal intensity you'd like to look at. Your softies will not suffer having less light during those eight weeks. <laughs> Rebo says, what are good corals for a sunlit tank? All of them. They come from the ocean where the sun shines on them. They love it. Problem is, sometimes sunlight coming in through a window can cause nuisance algae to grow, so make sure you stay on top of your cleanup crew. Uh, Bravo says, what type of cleanup crew and how many of each do you recommend for a 29-gallon biocube? I would recommend 29 creatures to work on your tank. Uh, that could include 10 astrias, 5 nasarius, that's 15 of the 29, um, 5 blue leg hermits, 5 red leg hermits, uh, tuxedo urchin. What are we up to now? 25? I don't know. But you see the idea? maybe one cucumber, like a tiger tail cucumber. That's it. You know, you just have a nice mixture of hermits and snails and urchin and cucumber. You could even put in one uh, sand conch in there to work on the sand bed, but that's it, no more. Sand conchs need a two foot by two foot area. Your 29 gallons a little small for that, but you might get away with a sand conch too. Arowana says, what do you think of the API test kits and, or what do you use? I use API for nitrate. Um, I've used it for ammonia. I use ELOs for alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, phosphate. I use a refractometer for salinity. I use uh, the Apex controller for measuring pH and temperature. I think that's it. See, I was right about the candy corn. Andrew says, great job on the stream today. Very informative. Helps me pass the workday on the candy corn candy corn seed harvest. Austin says, have you ever tried mangroves? I tried to grow them once for fun, and it just got tall. It had some leaves, and then it just stopped, and then it died. Um, I think if I were to really, I mean, I don't know. I, I'd have to do some homework, maybe talk more with a few people who have done it successfully. But I think the number one rule, number one, you're supposed to rinse the leaves off with a, a mister, spray off the leaves so the salt comes off and they're clean. Um, but I think you have to have a light that moves up as it gets taller. And if you can kind of keep up with it and not hurt the root system, you might end up with a really nice mangrove bush that eventually becomes a mangrove tree. But uh, I've always had just a branch, and it just it was kind of neat for a while, and then that was that. Let's see. There's more beard talk happening here again. What happened? Stay on topic, y'all. Um, okay, Macy's daddy says, if you could no longer use lights, what lights would you, you know, the ones I use, what could you uh, use instead? Um, I think if I couldn't do the metal halides anymore. I mean, there's a lot of LED choices, but I'd, I kind of think I would lean into the T5 XHO combo. So I'd have T5 bulbs and I would have XHOs for supplementation. Maybe I'd put a couple of those Kessel or three of those Kessel 360Xs on there too. So I'd get kind of like three different things happening on the tank. And that would be kind of cool to do and be expensive because T5 bulbs are not cheap and having to buy those regularly would be really frustrating. I love metal halides. It's very hard for me to give up on those. But thanks for the question. Uh, Ori says, I added three dry Marco rocks to my established 20 gallon reef. Within a couple of days, I had a dino outbreak again. I beat them now, but do you have any idea why this happened? I don't recommend ever putting dry rock into an existing reef. I always want to cure it, which means put it through salt water, put it through power heads, you know, in the salt water, maybe run something to remove, you know, test, you can test and see. Odds are you're going to have phosphate at really high levels. And you could use something like phosphate Rx to get rid of the phosphate, change the water a few times, throw bacteria in the barrel. Just literally get the rock ready for weeks on end before it ever goes in your aquarium. So when you pick that rock out of the water, it is essentially, I mean, it ain't much, but it's a little bit of live rock going into your tank. But I think putting dry rock in causes all kinds of chaos. So I don't recommend that. Yeah, 
Yeah, Haley says, trying to find Sarah's nails is like looking for the, ho the Holy Grail. Uh, yeah, I haven't bought those in forever. I used to get them uh, from Keys Critters out of Florida. And then one day they just, the company evaporated, which is really frustrating because I loved getting my cleanup crew from them. And they, I guess they just closed their doors and never looked back and did not give me an email saying goodbye, Mark, which was disappointing because they were a great company to deal with. I bought so many thousands. I probably spent, between myself and club money, we probably bought fifty to 60,000 critters over the, the years we shopped with them. It would We would have such ginormous orders coming to Dallas-Fort Worth, you know, when I'd say, you know, we need... 600 astrias we need 500 cirrus we need you know this many blue legs and we need you know a thousand red legs we need peppermint shrimp and we need this we need that and they said when our orders come in they are so busy they can't do anyone else trying to take care of our order it's actually too much work for them so i ended up having them send everything in bulk to me and then i'd open up all the boxes and i would bag everything up individually for all the people i have a spreadsheet on my computer and this person will get their 20 serifs and their you know, 15 astrias and their peppermint shrimp and one urchin. And then this person got 200 snails and they got, you know, seven hermit crabs. And I had to get everything ready and then tell people, your orders are ready. Come over right now and get your stuff. Um, but yeah, that was a great company to deal with. I, there are some other people out there like reef cleaners. I'm surprised I don't have serifs. Maybe the storms on the Gulf are affecting things, the hurricanes. Michael says, would you ever consider putting a cleanup crew in a sump? No, I would not. I don't want anything that gets sucked into the pumps and stop the flow. So I don't put anything down in the sump other than stuff in the refugium, which is macroalgae. And even then, I don't have things in the refugium like, like snails or, you know, I put pods in there. But no cleanup crew. Someone wants to hashtag my beard. Let's see. Uh, the Incredible Arrow says, Hi from Germany. I do have a hard time growing algae on my rocks for the tangs. Any tips to improve decent algae growth for the fish? I wouldn't recommend that at all. I would prefer you put food in for the tangs, like on a clip. Um, I believe in Germany, you guys use butter lettuce, and you can actually put the lettuce down in the tank or weight it and then your tangs will eat that and you remove the core. Uh, but I would not try to intentionally grow algae on the rock because the only algae that tends to grow on the rock is not the kind your tangs will eat. So you end up with a hideous tank with all this hair algae and you'll have all these tangs that still won't eat it. You know, they might nibble at it, but they are not gonna eat it and get rid of it. Uh, Yashiv says, my nitrates are down to 1 ppm, and it was at 4 ppm last week. I think my refugium is working too well. Well, congratulations. How can I sustain 3 to 5 ppm levels while still running the refugium? I love the pods. I would think you need to dose a little bit of nitrate. I have something called Neophos, no, Neonitrate, that I sell for my shop. And you, I've got a small bottle, and you can dose that to maintain a low level of nitrate and not go too low. Scott is talking about my shirt, which says, eat, sleep, reef, repeat. And he says, as you get older, how have the ratios changed between eat, sleep, and reef? Uh, I haven't changed a bit. <laughs> I eat, I sleep, I reef, and I do it again every single day. The nice thing is I'm not like killing myself on the reef tank. I'm just enjoying it. And uh, that's what I was mentioning earlier. I haven't had to put my hands in the tank. I haven't had to do anything. I worked a little bit on the anemone cube yesterday just because I was in the mood uh, I siphoned the sand bed because there was a lot of Aptasia living in the sand. And so I thought I'd suck out a bunch of those little bastards. <laughs> and uh, I ended up pulling out of the system about 11 gallons of salt water, two buckets worth. And so I went ahead and I refilled from the big water reservoir behind my reef into the sump. And, you know, the, it, everything just continues like nothing happened except the sand's a little cleaner in that tank. Since the anemone cube has about 14 fish in it, plus about 40 anemones, I feel like the sand bed gets really dirty in that tank because it's a very small footprint, two foot by two foot, with all those clownfish eating every single day and pooping in there. So I want to remove some of the detritus that builds up in there. And eventually one day I will work on this sand bed to try and clean it, but I have to move everything off the sand to do it, which is a lot of work, and I don't want to do it. So it, that's why I keep saying eventually. But no, I think my ratios are pretty much the same. I'm pretty consistent. 
Gabriel says, any opinion on algae scrubbers? Well, I've only tried one. I'm using the uh, Foursquare Aquatics. Uh, it looks like a file cabinet, and I'm really impressed with it thus far. But um, I can't really say all the other ones if they're good or bad. I've seen some other ones that just seem to be small, and uh, I don't know how effective they are. But this one definitely grows algae, and uh, it's available from BRS. All right, we have gotten to the end of the live stream because no more questions are happening, and I'm going to bow out of here right now. We have been streaming for two and a half hours. I think that's plenty. I will see you guys next weekend, and I thank you so much for listening as long as you did. 262 eyeballs are still on this stream right now. Uh, if you have any questions, come to Club Meals Reef, ask your questions there, post pictures, share your experiences. I love seeing what you guys are doing. Today, this morning, I was scrolling through Club Meals Reef and replying to a few things, saying, that's awesome, I love it, that's pretty, I want to copy you. Because it's true, you guys inspire me just as much as the things I tell you about help inspire you. I think we work great collectively, and I think we should continue to build each other and uh, help our everyone be successful in keeping these corals and fish alive and healthy and thriving. So that way um, we continue this hobby on well into the future. That's it. I'm stopping. I hope you guys have a great weekend and I will see you next week. Bye.